So everyone, in addition to everything else going on today and beyond, this is like GSAP history, the first time ever GSAP doing a webinar. Um, but more seriously, I want to, you know, welcome everyone to the GSAP Advanced Studio 6 Super Crit. Um, as you all probably know, this is the last session in our series of studio-wide Friday sessions during the semester. And as you also probably know, the Super Crit is really the other bookend to the studio lottery. With the studio lottery, showing a five minute presentation from each studio by the critic at the beginning of the semester and then the super crit showing a five minute presentation from each studio by the student at the end of the semester so it's kind of two different snapshots on the work of the studio and the methods of the studio and the topics of the studio um, our our kind of guest critics uh, this time consist of three people from outside of the school. Um, we have Irene Cheng, who is an architectural historian and associate professor at California College of the Arts, as well as partner and co-founder of Cheng and Snyder. Um, so I don't know if Irene, you can wave. I can't see everyone at the moment now, but um, thank you, Irene, for being here. Uh, we also have Stephanie Carlisle, who is principal and environmental researcher at Kieran Timberlake, as well as lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania School of Design. Thank you, Stephanie, also for being here. And the third uh, critic is Tim Michels, a structural engineer, designer, and preservationist, and also currently part of the school, um, an adjunct assistant professor uh, here at Columbia GSAP, uh, uh, and although not teaching in Advanced 6, part of the uh, Columbia GSAP faculty. Um, so as you probably already know, um, the, the format of this is going to be similar to, you know, what we did last semester. Um, so this is meant to be a kind of collective discussion about the studios, their approaches, the work of the students, um, the type of topics, um, and you know an open-ended discussion about our work kind of as a collective um, the way we'll structure this is to have uh, one project from each studio uh, present there will be a pretty strict pr uh, timeline for this and we'll structure this along um, it, or in the order of having uh, four different groups where for each group we'll have four or five different student presentations right in a row followed by a session of brief discussion, and then we'll repeat that, another four or five presentations, another discussion. And so in that way, we hope to kind of uh, draw out some interesting themes from the work and have an interesting discussion today. Um, all of the presentations, you know, with a couple of exceptions, I guess, um, will be controlled by our fearless uh, studio-wide TA, Skylar Royal, so she has the toughest job of anyone today. Skylar, thank you for all of your help in collecting the presentations and running this session. Um, so by design, we're asking each presenter to um, have to say next slide when they want the slide to advance. Apologies to everyone for that um, aspect of the format, but I think we'll get used to it and it should be fine. Um, and finally, um, students will receive a signal when they have one minute remaining and uh, when the time is up, you know, we're really asking you when you hear time is up to basically conclude your remarks right then. If everyone takes an additional minute to finish, then it'll really cut into our time for a group discussion. Um, so with that, I think everyone should know the order of presentations. We've distributed that to the students, uh, the faculty, and also the guest critics. And I think we will um, launch right into the first presentation. So maybe Skylar, if you wanna share your screen now. Um, and I'm gonna pull up the list myself, but I believe the first presentation will be from Jing Lu's studio. Uh, just go. 
Okay. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Ed. And uh, I don't see the shared screen yet. Yeah, I think, Skylar, have you shared yet? This won't count on your time, Ed. Okay, thank you. Okay, now I think we see it, right? So it's gonna go into your read mode or full screen. Is this just right, one, are you ready, Ed? Just one more note, sorry, Ed, right before you start. Um, if you are not currently speaking, if you could turn off your camera, I think that that would make, um, will make the experience um, a lot better so that we can understand who is presenting um, rather than focusing on everyone's video feed. Yeah, that's a great point. So actually, Skylar, you could also turn off your camera. And so we'll just have, that'll, that'll be a way to focus on only the presenter, right? The current presenter. Hi, my name is Ed. Uh, firstly, I cannot summarize thoroughly the depth of the studio concepts only with few sentences, but in general, as the title explains, it is a street studio to research and introduce an architectural intervention on Fulton Street Mall in Brooklyn by introducing the new players in the street, rediscovering past experimentations that might still offer relevance, and studying possible new typologies that might be constitutive of the contemporary discourse. Next. Uh, I would like to start my presentation with installation art titled Over the River by inspiring artists Crystal and John Claude. Two artists are inclined to um, experiment their projects within the nature through massive scale and materiality to create unperceived moments to achieve pure joy of audiences. Next. However, their projects due to its massive scale are often brought up disputations from local communities especially over the river project. In order for permission to be granted, he had to go through the lawsuit almost for 25 years. Next. And next. Next, oh yeah. However, their projects do to its uh, no. However, interesting idea comes when he suddenly decided not to pursue his project. And what makes the project more interesting is the history and the process of actualization. Next. Local communities stood, uh, stood against the project because of its threat to ecosystem of the site, Arkansas River. However, in other perspectives, Perspectives. The potential benefits to the site is quite abundant, such as economical benefits from visitors and ecological benefits even to some animals. So when I researched and analyzed the project over the river, I figured that this project is intriguing about the fact that it reveals the complexity of the phenomenon in nature to the surface, which were already there but invisible, with simple gesture can be. Next. This is an informative and analytical drawing of the project over the river and listed uh, all the animal and plant species and information about the site. Next. 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 In his proposed design, he used a perforated metallic canopy and suspended a tensile structure over the river. And what this does is through openness and reflection achieved by materiality, it projects earth and ground in one scene. Next. And this is where our site is. It is a Fulton Street Mall in downtown Brooklyn. Next. And I went through some examples of things that makes invisible visible. Next. 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 In my project, I try to express the concept through very minimal gesture and the complexity of the material. Next. This is the first sketch of my architectural intervention on the street. Next. And then I researched about the elements that compose the Fulton Street Mall and see what are the unintended consequences by introduction of those elements. Next. And I researched about the uh, uh, 
uh, the possible and potential purposes of those elements and categorized into interrelated concepts. Next. 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 And I went to um, sectional drawings of elements of the street to see how those interactions are made. And uh, those can be range of human occupation of the street and the range of the lighting and street signage. Next. 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 And those pink areas are where my intervention will be located on the site. And uh, those locations are selected based on the site conditions where the actual photomall begins and differences in height of the building on the site. Actual buildings on the photomall has relatively low heights than surrounding buildings because of its uh, assignment of historical preservation. Next. Next. In my project, it does not have a specific programs because my concept is to understand and reveal the complexity of the ecosystem, the street, uh, and also to see what kinds of unpredicted consequences possibly happen with minimal gestures intervention. Can you start the video, please? And I'm sorry for the silence in the movie. Uh, I couldn't merge the sound into the movie. Hope you guys enjoy. Um, okay, we have to move on to the next uh, person. So. Okay, I think you can maybe just yeah. scroll through that really quickly at the end, Skylar. Yeah, it's little, almost done. Yeah. Since this, and this was a little bit, you know, we were getting our system started, so you get a little bonus extra few seconds here. <laughs> and, yeah. But thank, thank you, you for the presentation. Okay, great. So, and like I explained before, we'll just keep going through um, three more presentations and then kind of start to unfold a discussion about them. Uh, the next presentation is from the studio by Stephen Cassell and Annie Barrett. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Erica and I'm from the Castle Barrett studio. Um, Skylar? Oh, okay. Perfect. Okay, uh, next. It's going to be so weird saying next. <laughs> um, I can present, yeah. All right, so the site program and universe of the studio takes place in a book called The City in the City by the author China Mayville. In the city in the city, we are introduced to Bazel and Okoma, two city-states that occupy the same physical territory, but where citizens are forbidden from acknowledging the presence of the other city. To navigate this social construct, citizens from one city unsee the people and architecture from the other, yielding a complex cross-hatching of the urban fabric. Violating or breaching the rules results in dire consequences. You're immediately removed from both cities by a mysterious and shadowy neutral third entity 
never to be seen again. Written as a police procedural, the plot follows a detective from Bazell as his investigation into the murder of a young Canadian exchange student takes him from his home city to the other. Copla Hall is a shared city hall for both Bazell and Okoma, a huge complex building housing both bureaucracies. It is the only gateway from one city to the other, and it is the focus of our studio. Next. So we began the studio by deconstructing the text to develop an understanding of the nuances and conditions that a cross-hatched city and society imposes on its citizens. There are descriptions of the city, but of course, uh, there was no physical form for us to work with. So the first task was to design the city together as a studio based on our understandings from the novel. Um, here you see an analysis of the greater city region completed by our studio member, Jack Lynch, um, which the rest of the studio used as a starting point. Next. As we narrowed down the urban context, the studio divided up into two groups, each representing one city, and we held town halls to reach a consen consensus on the site for Coppola Hall. Next. We mined the novel for descriptions of the architecture, designing a set of architectural features that embody the qualities of the respective cities. Next. And the site for Coppola Hall is centralized in the city, um, which is part of the old town that you see here highlighted in a darker gray. Next. So the old city is also the most notoriously cross-hatched, which means that um, uh, both the cities sort of exist, exist adjacent to each other um, versus some of the total zones that you see on the outlying regions where an entire um, area might belong to one city. The color coding represents the different cities, red versus blue. Next. And, oh, too far. And here we see the finalized design of the site. Um, so here, from here on out, I'm gonna get into uh, my own interpretation of the site and my proposal for Coppola Hall. Next. So there are clues in the book that reveal a precious shared past where the cities were built on the bones of an ancient civilization. Next. We imagine this excavation site as an early attraction that brought both cities together, working alongside one another, but neither lane claimed this initial discovery. Next. Before designing uh, Coppola Hall itself, we started with the design of a gateway, which is the border crossing between the two cities, um, which could later um, inform the character of Coppola Hall. So for this proposal, um, um, I proposed a series of walls that bridge across the entire site, across the original shared site of the city's roots. Next. Next. So as these walls traverse the site, there's an opportunity to slip below the surface of the city, an opportunity to escape the chaos, entering a no man's land. Next. Next. So you see here, um, these things that would initially be considered walls could also be sort of reconceived as bridges passing from one city to the next. Next. So from the gateway, this translated to the design of the overall city hall, which is of course um, still in progress. Um, so if the walls were sort of extruded to the scale of a building, um, this is what it would look like. And you see here on the left side that there's sort of this counter um, character to the city hall itself, which is in the form of a large public park. Next. One minute remaining, please. Oh, sure, okay. <laughs> Um, and imagining these bars as a series of different programmatic elements that actually mix the two cities together, um, where entrances from uh, both sides would be um, uh, given to each of the cities. Next. And sort of um, reimagining what the idea of something that's double-ended could be like. Next. I'm just going to blow through these slides then. Um, so here's a section looking through um, this underbelly of the city where it would be um, a communal um, public space um, and the bars above that are separated into the programmatic elements with a transverse connection across. Next. Um, the experience from the street, next. Um, and then you can kind of flip through the next four or five slides, Skylar, to show the buildup. So you see the public uh, space there underneath and connecting above, next. And the circulation um, connecting the bars would ultimately be the place that would um, be the place of interaction between um, city officials of both cities, next. And um, there are variations on how the circulation could work, next. Next. So we leave off with a final um, scene from the book, um, which kind of culminates in this really dramatic shootout. Um, and this is what it would be like to be in this sort of um, no man's land underbelly of the city.
Thank you. Great, thank you. You, you hit the deadline just in time. And Great. thank you, and apologies if it's gonna sound rude me continue no, to say okay. when time is up, but great, you, perfect five minutes. The next presentation will be from uh, Hillary Sample's studio, and I believe it's Matthew Asir. Hello, um, my name is Matthew and I'm from the Sample studio. So it started, um, the studio is comprised of three distinct yet interrelated parts, mixed use, staircases, and social. So mixed use in terms of repetitive structural grids that are adaptable, staircases, unambiguous interconnected circulation spaces, and social, um, urban socialization and associated spaces of today. Next. So um, we, we aim to um, analyze Washington DC in these terms. Uh, next. So to begin um, from staircases, uh, next. Next. <clears throat> uh, we want to understand different typological approaches and forms of staircases from the gallery to the National Museum of Women in the Arts, discovering and expanding upon multiplicities of choice and experience through different uh, assemblages of form. So next. Next. So you get to see how um, next, how these begin to um, create different iterations of uh, direct and non-direct approaches, single, double, and then the different versions of how it could assemble to a surface, a tower. Next. Next. And how this um, creates different multiplicities of choice and experience. Next. The next element being uh, the social. So um, through our uh, walks and explorations, there was um, urban bird habitats along the National Mall of Washington, D.C. So this brought on this uh, need for communal spaces for urban species, human and non-human. Next. Next. And so I started to analyze uh, contained ecosystems and try to understand how this could be um, related to uh, social spaces. And uh, next. And how from um, the aviary moved from an observation cage to an educational device. Next and uh, the materials of uh, ecosystems. And next. Next, which turn into these uh, weaved surfaces of uh, different densities and transparencies. Next. Uh, then um, analyzing uh, the botanical garden through its mixed use properties of um, how it has uh, this organic growth through um, rigid structural grids. Next and how this could be um, combined with um, the urban and bird habitat. Next, in, in terms of uh, the bird's needs and creating these um, uh, interconnected social spaces of human and non-human, next. And different assemblages of this within the structure, next. Um, so this all ends up in uh, creating a project that aims to reimagine the typical atrium space of buildings in Washington, DC through the collision of program in nature. And uh, it aims to question the boundary of interior and exterior space in service of a self-sustainable, dynamic architectural ecosystem. Next. So um, it begins by uh, creating a sort of um, interior uh, aviary that's nested within the building that opens up to the uh, urban plaza and uh, across into uh, the adjacent parks. And then is uh, capped off by uh, rings of program that uh, next um, rings of program that are set within the, the rigid grid on the periphery. These are programmatic events that include uh, bird re rehabilitation centers, research labs, seed vaults, roof garden, and other um, elements that service this interior ecosystem. Uh, uh, next, so you can see here it's um, that you're able to enter below. Um, blow into this uh, park that's uh, set into the atrium with layers of uh, mesh material next. And how all of these elements are set within this rigid grid. And uh, there's these staircases that uh, lead up similar to the assemblages from before that uh, connect across the atrium space. So next. Next. 
and are able to um, cut through the atrium space. So you're able to climb underneath using it as a park, um, sort of an, an interior park, but it's exterior. It's covered in mesh and it has all these layers as you go through. And uh, once you're in there, you're able to look up and see these paths crossing that go between the different interrelated programs that are meant to uh, service and create that interior space through its um, uh, greenhouses and uh, research labs. Next. Next. Here's another illustration of that. Uh, next. 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 <laughs> and then uh, this, the central space blown up more also. Uh, next. And next. And then how that could be rendered in different materials and how it evolves over time. Thank you. Perfect. Again, perfect timing. Thank you. And the last presentation for this first set of projects is from the studio by Stephen Hall and Demetra Charalia. Uh, and I don't think I can. Um, Great. Um, and sorry. So just make sure to introduce your, yourself as the student. Yeah, give your name. Yeah, my name program. is Thank you. Yining He. I'm partner with Yu Xinghu, and we are from Ho Studio. The Ho Studio started abstractly from a piece of music. So basically, we're designing a console hall in Prague, designed based on piece of music from a composer. And the music we chose is from Dvorak, the New World Symphony X. Uh, we're really interested in the duality of this piece. It is uh, music by a Czech composer for the US, something from the old continent is uh, composed for the new world. It is, uh, and by Dvorak, he says that, that the inspiration comes from by injecting a kind of black Indian music, soulful music into a really classical structure. Next. And then we are designing this kind of device to showcase that uh, showcase that this typical melody that's reappearing in this whole chapter. Uh, so uh, it is in, in space, it's more like a typical ratio pattern reappearing in this volumetric way. Next. And then we, we have done this test multiple times just to show that there could be a potential acoustic voice in this reappearing uh, fashion. Next. And then by that device, we can see that each volume can form a really dynamic section drawing. And then each one is really different from each other, but they are interconnected through this volume. Next. Next. So by model, you can see that uh, the way we did our physical model is by slicing those sections and kind of putting them together. Next. And then by that, we can form this kind of thick wall, volumetric acoustic walls, just to have those kind of uh, expression. And then from each test, the expression is different. Next. Uh, for sometimes it looks like this. Next. And then uh, next. The way we chose these two tests is that they are formed by a really simple method, but they have really different expressions. One is more, you know, have funny shapes, have is more closed. The other one is more open, is more porous. Next. And then we are think after that, because this resembled the duality that we talked before, so we're thinking what's in between those two walls. Next. Next. And my partner can take over at this point. Okay, so uh, as we continue to like zoom in to develop the auditorium space, we find that uh, the auditorium space is actually highly developed and pragmatic. So we like started to try understanding how our language of the uh, acoustic voice in the uh, sick war can be integrated with the uh, VNR plan seating. So. Uh, 
from the left to right, you can see how our developed and next. And this is uh, how we like organize uh, four of our SQLs together and uh, assign them different uh, programs. Like uh, also we have a lot of supporting functions like uh, the uh, ticket ticket office, uh, uh, some cafeteria and some other functions and next. Uh, this, this kind of shows uh, how we are like trying to make use of the cracks in our worlds and the uh, gap created uh, like in between two uh, sick walls to be uh, entrances to uh, our uh, interior spaces. Next. Uh, and some of the uh, openings on, on the walls can be transformed into uh, open seats, sky gardens, uh, and other entrances. Next. Uh, this is uh, like a street view depicts the view you are like standing in the street. You can see uh, how the uh, frontality of the wall transformed into the uh, facade. And next. One minute remaining, please. Okay, next. Uh, next. Uh, so uh, then we continue to develop our interior space in this uh, section perspective. Next. As you can see, we have languages directly from the wall and we have the language from the VNR seating, which is a blue part and the yellow one integrating the two together. And next. And then, uh, and, and next please. Yeah, and then we also like trying to like work together with the uh, uh, side line and other things next. So this is the section perspective we developed. As you can see, the solid walls are not like solid spaces. Actually, they are like uh, having supporting functions serving the uh, auditorium and next. So this is our uh, interior rendering depicting the view you are like sitting uh, to the side of the uh, stage and next. Also a rendering, as you can see, the uh, thick walls actually create spaces. Those gaps at both sides, they are like work as uh, entrances and next. So we also have some that, like very special seating, like uh, because from the wall language, we extruded some of them and they are at, the, at a relatively high space. We also think about transforming those seats into special seats where you have a spatial experience. You can hear the music, but you actually don't have a visual contact with the orchestra. So uh, this is also a kind of experience we want to explore and that's pretty much we have. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, so let's see. Uh, I think, I'm not sure. Is, did you s stop sharing, Skylar? Yes, I'm now seeing. Yeah. Okay. I stopped it. Do I need to, should I share? Um, um, no, I just didn't see that. So now I think Lila, so again, um, for everyone, this is our first time doing a webinar. So please bear with us. Um, Lila, could you make uh, the cameras of the critics live now? Or is that something they should do themselves? What do you think is the yeah, best? are ready. And if you place, if everyone places their screen into um, into gallery view instead of speaker view, you should be able to see all three of the critics at the same time. Um, it looks like each of you are muted, so I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you, the critics. There you go. There's a comfort in being muted though. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimate power I'm wielding here. Getting you. Great, so, so, um, there was obviously a, you know, a variety of different projects presented and I think you know, they were, um, uh, you know, each had their own world they were responding to. So I think part of the discussion is just to start thinking you know, in the broadest sense, how can something like Advanced Studio at a place like GSAP have you know, the best of the diversity of all the different approaches and research interests and topics and sites and programs and types of representation have the best of the diversity, but also participate in a, in a shared discussion. And, and I think that's um, an aspect in a way that we've been 
working on in the past couple of years for advanced studios at GSAP, but it might be a little generalizable as well to like, how do we as a discipline, both in academia and in the profession, you know, each do our own thing, but kind of come together under like, what, what do we have in common? What unites us? What are, how can we, you know, have a shared discussion around some of these topics? So um, that, that might be one of the things that we try to trace as a thread through these first four. But I think we can also explore some other observations and topics that any other critics have. Well, I can jump in just to break the ice, maybe. Sure. Thanks, um, Irene. I, I don't know if I have a kind of idea yet about sort of what is the commonality or what sort of unites the different projects, but maybe I can start with just differences. It's so interesting, I think, to see this panoply of projects from different um, studios and to see the different methodologies. I'm, I'm sort of, at least initially, as I'm kind of, you know, um, trying to work through what I, what was just presented, more struck by the differences. Um, so maybe we can start there. Yeah, um, and yeah good. I'm, I'm buying time for the other critics to identify the similarities. <laughs> um, uh, I'm struck by the different starting points and then the kind of evolution of the projects and then sort of where they end up and struck by, for example, how um, Ed's project starts with a kind of artwork and analysis of an artwork. And then, um, you know, in the kind of, endpoint the the final project i see the kind of um, um that translation and some of the material properties and and even some of the formal properties of the uh, uh initial inspiration the christo um artwork still sort of residual in the um the 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 end point the the final project and um what i see as the strength of that project is i mean the kind of utterly beautiful form um and it's um, both a kind of ethereality, but plausibility as a kind of installation in this space of the Fulton Street Mall, um, but also productive of such a kind of extraordinary aesthetic experience um, that really came across in the renderings. And I think that's a kind of thread of continuity from the original starting point. Um, then with the City in the City project, Erica's project, starting with a novel, a conceptual sort of sci-fi novel, and then ending up with a kind of um, proposal that seems less, you know, like a kind of realistic proposal to be built than a conceptual provocation. It still has that remnant of a kind of sci-fi feeling about it. Um, in the case of Matthews, like starting with a kind of architectural typology of the stair and then sort of integrating that into a specific kind of building proposal, you know, kind of spatially intricate um, uh, building de design. Um, the, the uh, Yining and Yushin's project at the end, that's the one where I see the kind of greatest leap, sort of starting with a piece of music and then ending up with a concert hall. And in between there was this kind of moment where I, I, I couldn't, wasn't quite sure whether it was like the music was translated into this formal model and then became a building. So I was really curious about that moment of translation or conversion. But yeah, I mean, for at least a kind of initial thought was just sort of, um, uh, I was, reflecting on um, the different starting points and how those are both determining of and also allow for sort of different endpoints. Yeah, that's, I think that's, that's a nice way to, to start us off. And that, that speaks, I think, to the kind of studio method, because part of this is about like, what did you produce at the end? But part of it is about like, how do you, how do you design? What is a way to get from A to B and where do you even select as the A and the B? I was very much struck by this image of Matthew where he showed um, the birds in a cage mixed with humans and I could not help but reflect about our current situation where we're all grouped up and still all four projects so prominently addressed public space in a way, addressing how people come together. It was in clearly in ads projects where he decided not really to intervene on the existing buildings, but model something around it. Then we had the public plaza under the newly designed city um, in Cupola Hall studio, the birds. And then I, I especially in, um, in the Prague studio, I was struck by the challenge of, um, you know, 
designing a new space um, for a large public in a place where there is such a great history of music and taking on that challenge of doing something radically different in Prague um, that's still from the outside sympathetic to the street views that were shown, but then I think radically innovative and um, on the inside and the technology was used to create that and getting that inspiration from sound. Um, that struck me very much. And I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around um, how we should start thinking about these public spaces now that, you know, we're all cooped up and how these projects could be translated. Um, yeah, those are my first impressions, I would say. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting way to think of them together. I think, um, you know, similarly, all of the projects were really dealing with uh, enclosure and threshold in very different ways. And it came out and kind of like unfolded in each of those pieces, I think, quite um, it, it, with some surprises as well. So the um, with Ed's piece in the beginning, it was interesting because if the Christo project is really um, sort of a membrane that both reflects and reveals. It was interesting to see how the intervention that you chose really turned into these these gateways, right? Which first revealed themselves as walls, but then as we saw in the video, I found it you know quite surprising that they too had a sense of enclosure and were inhabited by people as well. There was something really, really nice about that moment where you could see that you could be inside that threshold. They weren't just gates at every uh, street enclosure on Fulton Street. Um, you know, similarly, I think there's that question of the, with the city and the city of um, trying to manage how people occupy space together and what that looks like in this tension between the wall, the hallway, and an actual space, um, obviously with the birds and the third project as well. Um, in, in all of them, I feel like there are some some questions it seems that you're all still sussing out of who is occupying these spaces and I think it, it can always be really or often be really challenging when talking about the city to um, figure out how to create sp spaces that are equitable but also acknowledge that people would experience those spaces differently right and they they are in a place right now these projects where there's so much potential i think to explore that a little bit further you know and think about um, whatever categories are particularly helpful for you whether it's characters or behaviors or agendas you know who are these people what are they doing um, rather than a sort of typical person um, what is the variation of that experience because i think that would even help um, push even further the exploration of the interventions that have been made with City in the City. I think, um, I'm not familiar with the book, but I think that I would be quite interested to see, um, you know, how you could even draw from that text a sense of characters. Um, and also, you know, is there a real difference between those two cities and how the inhabitants of those cities uh, would move through this uh, government building? Um, and I didn't expect that, that theme would carry through at all with the, with the final project, but I thought what was quite interesting is that I, I, would, I tend to think of an opera hall as being quite enclosed and impermeable. You know, it's a, a special space unto itself that is separate from the city. And halfway through that presentation, I think the, the way that that team is starting to explore openings and aperture it was really, really compelling. Um, I wonder if it came also, I wonder to Tim's point about, you know, this moment of us not wanting to be completely contained. Um, everything, all of the exploration seemed to be very much about the stage and the acoustics. And then there was this moment where you could see the city, you know, outside. And then I think that's something that we're all, you know, thinking about right now is what are those different perspectives? What does it mean for the viewer that's in the balcony that can't see the stage? Um, as they said, they really wanted to explore withholding sight, um, the, the sight of the visual sight of the stage. And I think that it similarly for all of the everyone in the interiority of that space, what does it mean to be completely removed from the site of the city itself? So I think I think there's a lot of really interesting themes to keep exploring in that project as well. I really like this question about um, who is the public. 
Because it does seem like that's a kind of um, fraught question in architecture. And it, when you when you posed that question, Stephanie, it it did seem like there's sort of um, implicit answers, but not so many explicit ones. I think the um, Matthews project, where there was clearly a desire to expand that public to multiple species, humans and mm -hmm. birds, you know, um, uh, and maybe if there were more time, we could have heard more about like how, how those species are interacting and how the building mm -hmm. is kind of responding to each of those um, constituencies. But um, we do have a tendency, I think, in architecture, there's been a long history of, of this in architecture, of kind of abstracting that public mm -hmm. as a kind of generic or, um, you know, undifferentiated or homogenous public. And um, so, you know, I think that question could be posed to each of these projects in the case of the Fulton Street Mall, you know, who are the residents of that neighborhood? How, how might they respond differently um, to this kind of beautiful, you know, gateway structure or form? Um, I was curious with the city and the city having not read the novel, um, you know, of course, it, it, I think that the topology and the kind of premise of these two communities or cities overlaid on each other, sitting lit, lying side by side and having to coexist and yet alienated from each other in some, some way. Of course, I'm thinking, you know, red and blue America, black and white uh, in the city. And so I, I was, you know, I, I sort of wanted more fleshed out sort of what were these, what, what's the kind of nature of these two cities that are being um, brought together? Um, in, in this kind of provocative way. So I think that question of like, how do you qualify and differentiate and make specific um, the, the, that, that public that um, architecture is addressing, um, I think is an important one. Yeah, and maybe, maybe some of these themes are, are ones we can pick up, at, you know, after viewing the next group, because, you know, based on the rhythm of this set up, we'll have to move on in, in just a second to the next group of presentations. But I wonder if we could also start thinking about representation a little bit, you know, about, you know, given these themes, what are the ways to draw them, either drawing the, the enclosures and thresholds, some things that are sometimes invisible, drawing the uh, relationships between species, you know, using a combination of more typical architectural representation, but some techniques of video or other ways of, of starting to make more science fiction-y drawings. Um, because I, I, I think it's an interesting moment, it's an interesting moment in a lot of ways for architecture right now, but including in representation when we've gone through a number of phases of emphasizing tools or returning to old modes of representation and an increasing sense of like these things that are so important that they can change the world stop us in our tracks like a virus or like climate change that are just totally invisible so how do we possibly start representing those as well as the other intentions and themes of the project and maybe I'll just leave that as an open thing that we can kind of mm -hmm. track a little bit in the next round of presentations. So this will seem, I, I'm going to be the bad guy the whole day, I think, because just as we're getting interesting in the discussion, I'm going to cut that off to just like each project as it's you know, hitting its highlights <laughs> and keeping, it, keeping us moving. But I, I will, unless anyone has something urgent they're going to throw in right now, then I think we can move on to the next round of presentations and kind of continue these threads. Is that okay? No objections? Okay, great, thanks. So we'll, we'll get back in the, you know, we have two rhythms, the rhythm of presentation, the rhythm of discussion. So I think, um, Skylar, we're ready for you to share again. And we'll start off this sequence of presentations with a uh, student representing Galia Solomonoff Studio. Um, hello. Um, my name is Oscar Caballero, and this is uh, the studio led by Galia Solomonov and Woody Gold, something of value for the city of London. You can wipe out an entire generation. You can burn their homes to the ground, and somehow they'll still find their way back. But if you destroy their history, you destroy their achievements, and it's as if they never existed. Imperialism is the attempt of one country to control another, especially by political and economic methods. Colonialism is a distinct way of imperialism. The British invaded 90% of the world. 
during the invasion, invasions, there was an infinite transfer of valuable items. This is how today the UK possesses so many treasures that are not from British land, nor respond to British culture of the time. The traces of British colonialism are still alive and showing the deep-rooted political and migration crisis that many countries have been facing through the years. Layers of parallel histories that echo to each other in what it seems to be like an endless cycle of racism and disruption of human connections. Migration is connected to every aspect of a nation. It is the global transport and transnational connections that makes migration a political action. These heritage objects hold an, intri an intrinsic relation with migration. Um, no longer, uh, and they no longer hold the story of one place, but all of those places that they went through. What is interesting in the, what is interesting in the movement of these objects is that it happened through water. By following the liquid traces of these parallel histories, this project aims to navigate through the memory of water in order to tell the stories of these objects from their origin, extraction, and style, and recontextualization. The British Museum, Museum currently gathers most of the heritage objects taken during British colonialism. There are 170 museums in London, but none of them presents these objects from a point of view that is not the colonial point of view. So this project is not a museum for British colonialism or a museum of British colonialism. It's a memorial and museum that represents the stolen heritage objects taken during British colonialism. It aims to relocate the pieces from other museums in London and open the possibility of a rightful place for a semblance and celebration of history and culture. Language is an important part of the project, so the first step was to create a glossary database of several definitions of colonialism that haven't been addressed by their historical proven context. The research led me to analyze the common information that is presented in museums. So many of the words were replaced by factual data and a new description was created based on the origin, extraction, and exile of the piece. An inventory of some of the most controversial pieces led me to understand the traces of the migration of these objects. The place for the project is located in Shoreditch, London, an abandoned train station damaged by humans and time. Its main structure has been semi-demolished and nature has populated its ruins. What it might seem like apart from above, it's actually an inaccessible place. Due to the lack of information, a taxonomy analysis through photographs was made in order to reconstruct through drawings most of the existing structure. This proposal holds an appreciation for, the, for these ruins and its semi-demolished walls as a symbol of resilience, endurance, and the value that could bring the reuse of this architectural device. A memorial park will arise on top of the existing building, creating an accessible green space for the city. Time is usually understood as linear, but in this case, the galleries will approach the multiplicity of histories of each object. Water is a conduit to tell the stories through mechanical devices that will create an interactive experience of the user. The galleries will gather physical and digital data. The memorial part will consist of segmented walls that arise from the existing building, becoming a space for meditation and exploration. The program will consolidate exhibits contemplative spaces and interactive rooms. The journey through the building becomes, an explora becomes explorative, and as the user walks through the spaces, the use of light and, and uh, real and abstract water evokes a sense of the sublime and visceral of the stories being told. Uh, contemplative spaces emerge, in the case of the first space entering into the building, a dashing light that comes through natural elements ha that has been uh, extracted out of their original context, the roots of culture extracted from their land, Ocean tunnel exhibit, many humans and non-human elements were lost in the ocean in the attempt of taking them to Great Britain, becoming underwater secrets of history. Rain room, a space for meditation where the use of light and water creates an effect of endless continuity. Interactive rooms, as devices that shift the, with the movement of the user, revealing the parallel histories of the piece. Chambers that rotate as you go in showing the multiplicity of the stories of a single object, creating an intimate experience for the user. The project incorporates ephemeral elements of the surroundings. This gallery intersects the entire building and faces the lower train level on the outside. And as the train moves through the facade, it changes the perception of the gallery through shadows and sound. 
The history of humanity will never be rewritten, but can definitely be told from a different point of view. We need to confront the past in order to move forward. And I would like to conclude with a phrase of modern order king that reads, we are not the makers of history, we are made by history. Thank you. Great, thank you, Oscar. Um, and moving on to the next one, the next presentation is actually from my studio, David Benjamin studio, Eduardo. So hi everybody, um, I'm Eduardo from David Benjamin's Forest City Studio. And if you could go to the next slide, it'll just start with the video with the kind of narration um, and then I'll talk afterwards. I mean, I, I guess I apologize for the lack of audio, but there would be that sort of uh, accompanying it as well. But I gotta know, what's with the purple glowing box? Sometimes, if you pass by City Hall at night, you can see through the windows. All the plants and produce on the structures are interesting. But my biggest question is, is any of it really good? Is this how we'll be growing food in the future? You guys should like set up some tours or something. I'm sure the city would like to take a walk inside. And I don't mind volunteering as a guide either. Maybe a workshop or two but I'm sure you're all just waiting for more things to grow in. It might not be so cool to walk inside an empty box, but that's just my two cents. I'll end the letter with saying that it's pretty nice to see so many people setting up shop near the factory now. All the tents, lawn chairs, and tables. It's like a little flea market full of goods and things for sale. Some people even just come and hang out, playing music, catching up on gossip, trying to peek inside the farm and the timber factory. And I gotta wonder, is this what bigger cities feel like? And again, I won't lie to you, this has to be the most people I've ever seen around this place. Hope to hear from you soon. Um, okay, so if you could go to the next slide, please. So the video that just played was a kind of day in the life of a project that positions the forest, material production, food, and the production of energy. Um, if you could change the slide, please. Oh, back one, thank you. Uh, as a kind of expansion to a city hall and college station, um, it's trying to take 
those elements and sort of expand them into the civic capacity. And so the kind of focal point of the project, the roof, it ties together all the additions um, as it collects and concentrates heat from the sun to later convert into energy. The factory plays with what production, storage, and enclosure should look like. Its envelope able to grow and contract depending on how much material is coming into and leaving the factory. The farm aims to see what could be grown in a limited footprint in areas with less than ideal conditions, all while carving out space for the public to engage in and inhabit areas of production. So if you could go to the next slide, please. And so this project is just one of 10 in the studio that look at how timber can be the starting point for addressing the need to build for a growing world. Um, could you, next slide please. While also thinking of scenarios and remaining sensitive to environmental concerns with the end goal of being, how do we imagine the ways the built environment can come together in the future? Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, the next presentation is from the Mimi Huang Studio. Yes. Um, and please remember to introduce yourself. Hi, uh, I'm Wen Yan Liu from Mimi Studio. Uh, me and my partner Tian Yu um, is working on bioconstruction. So this studio is a factory studio. The studio is interested in developing what are the architectural opportunities for innovation at the scale of the factory building and its um, spatial component and its relationship to the city and waterfront. So um, our site is in Sunset Park, which is by the waterfront. Next. Next. Um, so the big image of our project is to shape the construction of, for the future. And um, we are looking at, first of all, we are looking at the current condition of construction boom in New York and Brooklyn. And there is a lot of construction projects going on before coronavirus. Um, next. And this one generates a question of construction waste boom. Over 6 million tons of construction and um, demolition waste are generated in New York City every year. Next. And 80% of them are not properly recycled. Next. So this one provides us an opportunity to rethink the whole process of recycling the construction waste. And we want to include this process into our first step as a factory. Next. And also we're thinking the new opportunity to use biological process to create new materials as biomaterials, which is more environmentally friendly and in economic, social, friendly to the society and to use the raw materials that sawdust from the construction waste to produce new materials. Next. So this shows the diagram of our um, factory process from um, recycling construction waste to producing new materials. Next. And then we look at um, the siting strategy. There is a Lafarge concrete plant in um, Sunset Park which you can see the close relationship to the residential area and it provides a lot of pollution to the city as well. Um, next. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Um, so it's showing its relationship to the city. Next. And we, we think this is a great design opportunity to replace this concrete plant with our new um, biomaterials factory to create a um, more um, public friendly waterfront. Next. And with them, we look into the growth, growth condition of biomaterials. It's very different from industrial process. It's more like a biological process. It has specific requirement in terms of temperature, light, wind, moisture, and it's provide us um, the thinking of cluster design to provide different um, intimate internal environment for different types of materials um, we want to produce next. So this um, basically showing um, the, the whole process, the whole form making is highly related to the environmental thinking of uh, creating internal environment. Next. And we look at um, the breathing roof ideas next for different, next. So 
So this cohesive um, roof we are thinking is to allow maximum light and wind that's coming from different directions to our city, to, to our factory. And under this cohesive roof is next, is all these different types of cluster that have um, different scale variations from pavilion to the next to the large auditorium type. Next. Yeah, this one's showing basically the, the variations of the, the tower itself and also the variations of the courtyard it generates for different types of space that needed to, um, for different activities that happens in our factory. Next. Yeah, that's how these two things um, come together. Next. And this one, basically the concept section showing from the first steps of um, recycle, collecting, recycling, recycled construction waste to produce new materials in the middle. And then the next is more social related um, activities. Next. Um, next. Yeah, this one's showing on the left side, left triangle side, it's showing the um, factory process from the goods coming from the city from highway, arriving at tipping place and then going to the um, sorting cluster to the bio cluster and then stored in the storage and going back to the city again and the middle part the middle alley showing how we connect um, public from the city to the park and the right um, triangular corner, corner showing how this is open to the public to the city next one minute remaining please um, next sorry you can just go next to the end. Next. Now, this one is the second floor plate, uh, showing how it's more connected on the second floor. Next. This is the structure unit. We want to avoid all the columns and hide all the structure inside the wall. Next. And the different types of the structure units. Next. Next. Yeah, this is how the cluster works together. Next. And the sections showing the pavilion part. Next. And this one is the, the units of sorting cluster. Next. Next. Uh, this section shows how all the factory activities happens and connected inside the clusters. Next. And that's some views from the factory clusters. Next. And how the, the courtyard works with the tower itself. Next. 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 And this one is the bio towers. As you can see before, it's showing how open it's on the ground floor and then how connected it is on the third floors as the bio cluster towers. Next. And this one basically shows how it's connected. As, we, as I explained before, all the different clusters works under a cohesive roof as the fact, new factory type to the city. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then the final presentation from this group is a student representing Enrique Walker's studio. Uh, I can't seem to start my video. Your video has started. You're, you're on. Oh, really? Yep. Okay. Uh, in addition to Haitong and Elena, yeah, I'm here. Okay. So we are Studio Walker, and we were tasked with um, doubling the surface area of three projects in Japan um, built 50 plus years ago by the Metabolist Architects. And it's going based on the growth, um, patterns of growth established by these metabolists. How can we modify these patterns for contemporary issues as these buildings were conceived? Um, over half a century ago. So we'll just go through each of our groups real fast and talk about 
on each of the parts. The metabolist group developed the language of elevating from the ground and emphasizing the supporting structure. Next. On this matter, we studied a, seri a series of buildings that have a conversation with each other regarding cores and horizontal plans. Starting the common centralized cores, Ken Sotanghe later developed his proposal into multiple cores that will serve an open plan. This would maximize flexibility, light, and movement in buildings, allowing a truly open space. These vertical structures became the host of services that would serve and connect these open plans. Next. We propose to keep the original Tensu structure, which is the building that we were supposed to work with. It will function as a large core by hosting and supporting our new proposal inside an air square. Next. Alternating floor plates would, that, would compose the, that would compose public space would be placed on the bottom part inside of our origi or origi original Tensu structure. As for the doubling, the proposal will go up and will be supported by two independent cores that will support themes from where floor plates will hang. Next. Finally, this side course would host the services that would feed all of our open horizontal plans. Next. Um, so, hi, uh, I'm, I'm Hai Tong, also from Enrique Studio. Uh, so, uh, a Karamash housing project is an A-frame uh, megastructure housing complex designed by Japanese architect uh, Seichi Otani, located in uh, Kanagawa, Japan. Next. Uh, over the time, the aging of the Japanese population, older people uh, uh, encountered loneliness, depression due to lack of uh, close family ties. And this issue also applied to the uh, Karamachi housing project. Next. Uh, next. Uh, next. Uh, with the study of uh, uh, houses and AFM structure genealogy, we decided to bring in the uh, uh, advantage back from the traditional Japanese houses and uh, uh, other AFM structures. Uh, and we are doubling the uh, public space and then creating a clash of new college program to the old uh, residence, uh, residential complex. We're transforming the old interior AFM space to an even larger AFM campus in the middle and creating more connectivity between um, buildings, uh, which bringing the vitality uh, back to the older community. Next. Uh, We're also doubling the size of individual units, which increases the individual unit capacity of the units and bringing the traditional Japanese denshi back uh, to the complex, which uh, not only allows a larger family size, but also uh, reinforces the family uh, ties for the whole community. Uh, next. And that's our project. I'll give, give it back to Isaac. Uh, so next. So we were looking at Masato Otaka, who was the eldest member of the Metabolist Group and his project in Sakaide, Japan, called Sakaide Artificial Ground, where he envisioned, envisioned basically these raised platforms existing above the old city to create a tabula rasa for the development of a new post-war Japan. Next. So this is a genealogy of some projects that he was either influenced by or worked on directly, but you can see that um, his concept was literally raising off um, from the existing ground uh, a platform, usually consisting of concrete, to um, build a new urban pattern. Next. Um, so looking at these projects, um, Sakaida Artificial Ground and then his later building, the Tochigi Prefecture Council Assembly Hall, um, he developed the artificial ground and began to um, thicken the ground essentially beyond just a single platform as you see in the top image, but then um, adding additional programs that um, could thicken the concept of what a ground conceptually could be. And then next. So these series show um, the development of the platform above the existing cityscape. However, the current issues that are faced in the project are underneath the platform. Spaces are underutilized and very dark. So what one of our proposals is uh, maximizing doubling the amount of void space to introduce light into underneath the platform. And next. Um, in addition, replacing um, what is an underutilized parking lot seen in the second axon and doubling the public program um, that happens underneath into a cultural function with access points and circulation routes that can allow people to 
penetrate the site rather than be relegated to the perimeter of the site as is currently. And the section below shows how we begin to really try to um, make alive again what is happening underneath and truly uh, create a city not only above but also below as well. And that's it. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, so that, that completes the second uh, kind of set of presentations. If we can pull back up the uh, discussion mode. Um, and I guess, as Lila mentioned before, going to gallery view is probably your best way to view this. So let's just let's just open it up, you know, in a way, continuing the, the theme of difference, but yeah, yeah. I think it, it was great, Benjamin, that you ended your, um, you know, our last discussion, bringing up the topic of climate change and the environment. And I think we really saw that topic permeates these four projects in a way. I think in the first project, what I really appreciated was that Oscar made this very deliberate choice to reuse the vaults that were already in place. And then what I liked really in Eduardo's project was that there was this strong focus on energy from a whole different range of perspectives. So on the one hand, he was using CLT to reduce the embodied carbon in the building. And then he was considering the operational by building a solar tower. And then with the next project, we really went into recycling. Um, we were looking at what Wenya was explaining and there I, I just think she's making such an, she was making such an important point when she said that in New York, we throw so much construction materials out and that we need to reuse them and that we, um, you know, need to build while recycling. And that immediately make me, made me think back about uh, the CLT and the timber, because very often we think of New York as a city of steel and masonry. But really, once you go out of Manhattan, everything is almost wood. And then all of our floors in Manhattan are this beautiful long leaf and yellow pine that's long grown and that every year just gets trashed. Whenever like a building gets remodeled, we take the wood out and we throw it out rather than just recycling it, which is perfectly possible. And then in the last project um, from the Walker studio, what I really appreciated was that there was a very clear effort to reuse buildings. So, you know, they have so much embodied carbon, what's there already. We're not just gonna throw them out and do something entirely new. No, we'll take what we have, we'll see what can we reuse, how can we reuse it, and then build upon that. So I really appreciated that very thorough focus on the environment and how can we build something sustainable in four very different approaches. I was struck by that as well. Um, these these projects, I, I loved all four projects and they were a little bit easier for me to kind of um, uh, unite conceptually in some of the ways that um, Tim has already mentioned. Um, I was very um, uh, inspired by the way that all the projects deal with the problem of materiality and the kind of material constitution of architecture um, and sort of recognizing that uh, architectural buildings are these kind of momentary embodiments of kind of larger flows and processes are and an architecture in a way is a kind of intervention into those um, flows or processes. I, I loved how that that kind of materiality was really highlighted and grappled with um, in all of these projects. I think they all sort of reveal that architecture is not something that's static, like a building is never a static formation but is something that is, um, you know, mobile, that engages questions about sort of where building materials come from, how they're extracted, how those materials move as, you know, over the ocean in the case of kind of the uh, modes of transport um, constitutive of um, British imperialism, um, you know, and then kind of undergo processes um, and, and including disuse and reuse. And even in the last project where that, that theme might've been a little bit harder to discern, I think there's a kind of you know, implicit politics there around um, preservation and reuse and the kind of intricate ways in which the students were um, 
uh, engaging the existing material and kind of re, re reworking the buildings. Um, so yeah, these were really thought provoking um, for me. Yeah, I mean, to, to continue on that thread, I, I really, um, those last, both of those comments all really resonate with me a lot. I think that you know, there, there's something also that really struck me in, in hearing all of these projects where there seems to be a, um, a desire and a sentiment to reveal to say, all right, here are all of these complex systems, whether it's construction or whether, I mean, urbanism, colonialism, all of them, right? What can we bring forth? Can we render them visible? Can we draw these systems in a way where we understand their parts and their pieces and their interconnection? Um, and it is interesting to me that, especially in the, the factory and the timber project, there seemed to be this desire to make those, um, processes and those industrial processes public in some way or at least a reckoning with that and um, Eduardo I'm sorry we didn't hear the beginning of your video but following along from the captions it seemed like that was even you know an explicit question of the narrator like what's going on in this building what's happening in my town you know and I I think it's so interesting to um, question as a designer or be in that space where it's uh, it's not always clear what to make public or what to make private, or what to reveal and what you're not revealing. I think that while we on projects are often trying to render lots of interesting dynamics visible, we're also always choosing to keep things hidden. And I think uh, on all of these projects, uh, you know, provide so many opportunities to question what is what is being revealed, what is being unearthed, um, and what has stayed hidden. Um, and that's not necessarily a a bad thing or a critique. I think it's more that as a designer, you really get to choose both physically as well as um, deciding which elements of the systems you find the most important. So is it important to trace where that construction debris comes from? Is it important to trace where it goes? Is it important to understand who's working in that factory? Um, I think with the, the timber project, I would be so interested to actually see more on the forestry side. Um, I feel like the production, at least in the, you know this small glimpse, was really well, really um, delved into in terms of CLT and the farming. Um, but I was so curious what landscapes all of those materials are really connected to, which seems like is also part of the project. Um, and. I think surprisingly for the first project for Oscars as well, you know, there's this question where now um, the context of these artifacts is not necessarily the physical geography they came from, but is also this social um, context of colonialism and history, right? That we cannot really remove ourselves from, but this real um, challenging question of how to contextualize and what you choose to put those artifacts around and how you place the viewer within them. So I, I think it's a big, it's kind of a big chewy question um, that it, it's very helpful, I think, to be able to ask us explicitly on projects what we're trying to reveal and what, uh, what we're either hiding or what is just uh, downplayed or less important in terms of all the systems in play. I think you said something very important there, Stephanie, and that was reckoning. And I think that's something that all of these projects did really well. They started with an excellent analysis and then came to indeed a, a very good decision of what to make public and what to keep. And I would especially like to applaud the first one, like Oscar, um, I think in your um, museum, that is not a museum about colonialism, but about um, memorizing what happened. Um, you really did that reckoning very well. Um, Yeah, and, and Tim, also, I guess to come back to the first comment, you know, you made, I actually, I appreciate like the, the optimism in these projects as well. And in your comments, mm -hmm. I'm always a little on the darker side. So, you know, it's, I, I totally agree with you. It's like, oh, look how we can actually address and solve some of these issues and start to actually grapple with environmental impact. When I see projects, I've often like, I, I go to that place, but first, I don't know if this resonates with any of the students, like, I kind of stop over and make a little stop in the space. It just is like, what have we done? Like, really? Like, 
uh, you know, you, you sit with all of that construction waste and all of the way things are right now and the way that we build and the way we deal with manufacturing, the mess we've made of the economy, of the environment, of colonialism. And I think that it's good to sit in that space and, and reckon, but not if it just stays there, right? So right. seeing these projects that really say, okay, what piece of that can I, can I pull forth on and not uh, gloss over all the troubles, but really try to do something um, specific and intentional and, and sort of like reckon with that actual, um, whether it's a historical context or an environmental um, or social dynamic is, um, it's, it's wonderful to be able to go to that, that space. Well, I think that's, um, I mean, you're sort of touching on the idea that architecture has different um, capacitors or ways that it addresses environmental problems or, you know, history of empire, colonialism. Um, you know, one vein is the kind of critical or the, you know, um, the capacity to reveal or make something public, um, that revelatory uh, sort of mode of exposure in order to raise consciousness about something. And then I, th I think what's interesting for me about these projects is that, you know, many of them do that, but they also like intervene materially mm -hmm. and, and transformatively. So it's sort of both, it's both that kind of critical um, move, but also actually sort of um, intervening in the, in the kind of material processes in a different way. And, and um, so the, I mean, I, I I wouldn't, I wouldn't call them post-critical projects, but in a way, like they're, they're sort of opening up this question of like, how do we go beyond simply just revealing the problem, mm -hmm. which is, you know, mm -hmm. one way that architecture historically has approached um, some of these issues. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. That's a, that's a really interesting thing to consider maybe generationally or like at this moment that, 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 that could be a, you know, a way that, the students are engaging the world in both of those modes that you're describing, Irene. And I just wanted to, you know, again, I'm gonna stop our conversation short, um, you know, even as there's more to say and we can continue some of this thread, but um, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, especially as each of you in, in appreciating the projects has talked about things like systems and flows and, um, uh, you know, broader issues of everything from culture to environment and energy. Um, nevertheless, we see a lot of building, right? I mean, the, the actual project is a building in almost every case. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder, it's, 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 it's um, I think, an open question, especially, Irene, picking up on some of your threads that, um, you know, maybe architecture and design is as much a momentary crystallization of these flows and forces as it as it is like some kind of final product and i think you know as everyone is picking up on like preserving aspects of of buildings uh, as an environmental strategy so um you know i i think a moment like this can be interesting to think about where where are we intervening? What, what is the outcome? So working on designing a building, especially when in the past there has been a kind of question is, do architecture studios need to produce a building? Should architecture studios be questioning the building as the, as the site of design and intervention? Um, and so maybe I'll just, I'll just kind of throw that out as a, as a possible topic for next time or thing to kind of think through. I, I think it's an interesting moment as students and the world is grappling with invisible things, things that are bigger than a single building, things that are like you're saying, Irene, not necessarily static, but more of these kind of dynamic systems. Then are we, should we still be after the building? Are buildings good examples of that? Should we be expanding the boundaries of the buildings or even just reconceptualizing what could be designing in the first place? So just as, as open questions. And I think now we'll um, switch modes again, back to presentation mode. And the next uh, presentation set, will start with a student from the Anna Pujaner studio. 
Uh, there are two of us. Um, Great, thank my you. My name is Adina. I'm Louisa. Uh, so, wait, sorry. Sorry, yeah. Um, so the Kitchenless Stories Studio looks at contemporary neighborhood kitchens, uh, a cooking infrastructure that is used by a community and operates at a metropolitan level. In this semester's particular case, we look at the system of communal kitchens of comedores populares in Lima, Peru, um, made prevalent by the efforts of women seeking to gain empowerment during wartime in the 1970s. These women were able to increase their political voice by cooking communally for their neighborhoods and creating centers of community life. And this was revolutionary in its moment. Um, the kitchen is where domestic work has progressively lost its economic value and become instead a labor of love as Silvia Federici names it. But domestic work has also lost value outside of the kitchen. And with our project, we seek to expand upon these commodores to include spaces of both communal cooking, but also communal domestic work. The communal mentality of the commodores originates from Minka culture, which is a deeply rooted Inca tradition of community work and voluntary collective labor for the purpose of social utility and community improvement. This mentality was critical in the growth of the Barriada neighborhoods of Lima, but today the conditions of the Barriadas face many challenges. Parents must leave the area to look for work. Many mothers work as domestic workers in the wealthier neighborhoods of Lima and can be gone for days at a time. In their absence, the domestic labor falls on the young daughters who must cook, clean, wash clothes, and care for their siblings. Girls spend about 80 minutes more per week doing chores with each year of age. By age 12, only 2.3% of these girls who labor as domestic workers are able to attend school because of the time spent on chores. This amplifies a gap, as a gender gap, as boys are not expected to forgo schooling for the sake of helping with domestic work. We recognize that the conditions of Lima, of Lima's economic economy, forces parents to work outside of the home for days at a time, leaving their children to do the domestic work. But, what we but we believe that this does not have to become a deterrent to these young girls receiving an adequate education. By expanding upon the Commodores, we take domestic work into the urban realm, making it visible and communal. By attaching spaces for education, we not only alleviate some of, these, some of the burden for these girls, we also give them time to participate in education. Um, we therefore designed an infrastructure of domestic work that acts as a bridge between the urban educational system and the existing Commodores system. Um, but the condition of the Commodores wall very much empowering women do not actually transgress gender biases as women are the only participants. So our project um, will engage both genders by making domestic work part of the educational curriculum for both boys and girls using the existing pedagogical reference of Montessori schools. With parents out of the home, elderly neighbors volunteer for roles to cook, care for younger children and clean, receiving then free meals in return. Labor is therefore also redistributed in a transgenerational manner. Um, teachers are provided through Lima's existing public education system. And in this hybridized system, community members engage at many levels then to foster the education of the next generation. So here in this plan, um, these program adjacencies make clear the ability for these structures to redistribute the time and the labor of the young girls in the barriadas and allow them to um, share this burden. Formally, this infrastructure of domestic labor becomes almost monumental with large concrete columns touching the ground to create spaces for the various programmatic elements. The canopy above delineates the space for activity below and allows for necessary shade and provides water which is captured through fog humidity up in the hills to the infrastructure. The structure is open and fluid to the surrounding neighborhood houses and the form of the columns differ depending on the programming. So at times becoming a stove, a sink, a storage unit. Spatial boundaries are therefore renegotiated. Domestic activities are taken into the urban sphere and cooperative care leads to a new typology of community in which different parts of the population collectivize reproductive labor. 
the, this emergent domestic education model may turn reproductive work from an oppressive discriminating activity into a liberating and cre creative ground of experimentation in human relations in the Barriadas. Thank you. Thanks. Great, thank you. And the next uh, presentation will be a student from Pedro Rivera's studio. And again, please introduce yourself. Hi, um, we're Julia and Mark from Pedro Rivera's studio. Hi. Um, Okay, um, so the studio is set in Manaus, a city of about 2 million people in the center of the Brazilian Amazon rainforest. Our focus, um, sorry, next. <laughs> Oops. Okay. Our focus is the growing indigenous population in the city and its relationship to indigenous languages. Next. Manaus is home to people from over 34 tribes um, spread across 51 neighborhoods, but the highest concentration um, can be found in the outskirts. Next. Moving to the city is often associated with the expectation of better health care and education, but it's often a result of increasing exploitation in the of the rainforest and climate change. Next. In reality, a lot of indigenous people are forced are faced with economic challenges, discrimination, little to no political representation and the pressure to fit in and hide their cultural identity. Next. Language is a crucial part of this identity and um, every effort to document the language, promote its transmission to younger generations is an effort to valorize the identity of the individuals who speak them. Next. Um, we have identified several efforts of language, revis of language re revitalizations um, in the community or in different communities in Manaus. Next. Next. And we would like to tap into these existing efforts. Um, next. So what does language revis revitalization mean um, in an urban context? Next. Our proposal is a network of community language centers um, focused on strength strengthening and adaptation of indigenous culture in the city through languages. Next. By providing audio and visual recording and broadcasting facilities, education and gathering space, the centers will allow for interaction and coordination between different groups. Next. We aim for um, creating a multifunctional space in which programs overlap, um, depending on time of day. Next. Simil similarly to what we have found in our analysis of spatial organization and indigenous architecture. Next. The zones are defined depending on time of day. Next. And the boundaries between public, private, inside, outside move dynamically. Next. Next. So our site is located in Tribes Park, a neighborhood um, famous for its indigenous diversity. Next. Next. It's a lively community with several small meeting spots. Next. And by setting our project um, there, we aim to make more public space accessible by prim primarily providing shelter from sun and rain. So uh, this is an outline of the plan of our project. Uh, next. The first uh, architectural move was uh, drawn from our studies in the kind of typological uh, architecture of indigenous groups. Um, a lot of the themes that we uh, tapped into while researching those structures um, focused around um, ideas of the center and the peripheral periphery um, borders and kind of soft edges between outside and inside. Uh, so our first architectural move was to create a perimeter around uh, the 
existing green space on our site uh, to define what would be like the inside of our project and the outside, and then to organize uh, the programs and spaces along the dichotomy that axis. Next. So then uh, to mediate with the kind of different programs we're incorporating, which are gathering spaces, uh, medical spaces, kitchen, workshop areas, um, and daycares, we've undulated the spaces to create moments of enclosure um, that kind of overlap with one another um, and orient the spaces either outside or inside, depending on you know, the privacy or um, functions of the program. One re remaining, please. Okay. Um, so here's the plan is uh, incorporating the rest of the landscape in the site. Um, the next most important architectural move was the design of the roof, responsible for not only delineating like the boundaries of the project, but also controlling the light and um, shading from the sun, and also um, moderating rainfall on the project at, in the rainforest. There's a ton of rain every day. Next. Um, so this is a, a grasshopper rainfall analysis of the shape of our roof. The small um, kind of skylights are the high points um, of the roof geometry. So you can see we studied how the rain falls and where it flows to hits our roof, and then use this to organize um, water catchment areas and systems and ways of mediating uh, water flow on the site. Next. Um, so we um, identified or um, basically made up a system of channels on the roof that would um, lead the water to the specific locations where we would uh, collect the rainwater. Next. Next. So in plan, this looks like um, this and basically makes the roof part of the landscape of the entire site that um, consists of different rainwater collection um, pools and uh, little streams that go through the indoor space, but also um, then collect further into pools at each end of the site. Next. This is our plan again with um, the programs that can extend and expand and contract. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. Um, just continuing to move on, and we have, uh, by the way, five presentations in this set. Um, the next one will be a student from the Mark Wasuda studio. Hello. Hi, do you mind starting it from the beginning? It's a time, Jeff. Yeah. Hi, I'm Grace. I'm in Marcus Sudo's um, studio, Cultural Agent Orange, focusing on the Vietnam War. Um, I, uh, in 1965, at the height of the Vietnam War, and just four years before Ho Chi Minh's actual death, the North Vietnamese declared Ho Chi Minh's body national property. In Ho Chi Minh's final testament, he requested that his remains be cremated, stating, there should be no bronze statue, but rather a small ceramic urn on tree-lined hills for visitors. Denying these final requests, the, parties began, the party began preparations for the long-term preservation of his body through a series of secret military operations. A special committee of Vietnamese medical experts was sent to the Soviet Union, where they met scientists in the notorious Soviet embalming laboratory, the Lenin Lab. Here they engaged in an intensive practical research learning and the painstaking procedures and techniques of embalming. Finally, at the time of his death, a collection of six Soviet and Vietnamese embalmers worked to remove critical organs of Ho's body. His lips were sewn together, false eyeballs were implanted to prevent drooping, his eyelids sewn shut. The body tissue was fixed with formalin, a formaldehyde solution to delay the cell walls from breaking down. Two gallons of formalin injected into the arteries at an incision site made near the neck. All this was completed under strict environmental requirements that provided a stable temperature at 16 degrees Celsius. Ho's body marinated in a chemical bath for three months. The chemical soup he eventually lay in is still used every 18 months as routine maintenance. 
that the meticulous work was in constant danger um, during wartime Vietnam. Ultimately, Ho's body was moved six times throughout the course of the war. Each time involved complex system of military operations and technical savvy. The modified truck was designed for transport. The body, um, massive ice blocks were used as air conditioners. The team carried enough chemicals for the unscheduled maintenance of Ho, Ho Chi Minh's body as it moved through the jungle. Specifically modified shock absorbers were reinforced with air pumps to reduce vibration. A special engineering brigade were assigned to survey and reconstruct the new laboratory, a secret K-9 military base located on a mountain in the jungle. The site had, been, had to be equipped with running water, electricity, and proper air conditioning. An existing glass hut at the base was used to house the body. A five meter wide and six meter deep pit had to be built underneath. No explosion was used. Instead, 1,800 manual drill twists lifted the hut in order to, for the pit to be dug. The question of how to move the body up and down without inclination came with a solution of a curved rail track system that was specifically engineered to move the body. Today, nothing of this military history remains on the site. The Bobby Mountain is now an ecotourism site. In the early 2000s, the state built a temple dedicated to Uncle Ho. This event uncoincidentally occurred soon after the true events of Ho's will were leaked and that his request of ashes remain. Is the temple an attempt to rectify and appease, to conceal another history by using religious connotations? More importantly, how can the space between his death and his afterlife at the mausoleum, as we know in Hanoi, be exposed? What is the future of long-term preservation of Ho Chi Minh's body? The proposal seeks to both expose and expand the material production of Ho Chi Minh's body and the architectures of his afterlife. Expanding the existing temple site at Ba Vi, the proposal is a memorial complex that unearths the military history of the site, acting as a counter narrative. The architectures include a laboratory museum and embalming school that inverts the logic of the mausoleum laboratory. Often hidden from public view, the laboratory here is instead fully on display, duly acting as an embalming school. It is the museum. Mimicking the military architectures of the site, visitors enter on a curved rail track that circumnavigates the laboratory spaces, where classrooms act as stations of reenactment for viewers. A cosmetic dis station displays the invisible surfaces, the sculpting and resculpting of test bodies. An embalming station becomes the new space where Ho's body is ritually embalmed every 18 months. Surrogate bodies are used in the interim to display the full embalming procedure. An underground tunnel mimicking the five meter by six meter pit carries visitors underground to the reprogrammed interior of the temple, where the space is similar in scale to the area where Ho was originally embalmed. Certain bodies that enter the site act as surrogate bodies, in which rituals associated with the care and maintenance of the body replicates that of Ho's body. The movement and dignified transfer of bodies is put on display. After maintenance, circuit, surrogate the su certain surrogate bodies are ultimately stored in a refrigerated storehouse where they await to be the inevitable replacement of Ho's body. Ultimately, the complex expands the hidden oppositional forces of state-sponsored state -sponsored veneration and uses them for display. Thank you. Great, thank you. The next presentation will be from the studio by Sarah Dunn and Martin Felsen. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, I'm Lena. Um, I'm in Sarah Dunn and Martin Felsen's studio located in Tokyo, Japan. Our project began with the research into a range of Japanese lifestyles. Next. Fo um, I focused on the Ma lifestyle, of which, which celebrates the negative space and absence of chaos. Next. Next. Then I looked into the Japanese Shotengai, a bustling street that involved that evolved from ancient markets to modern social and commercial hubs. Next. 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 Last, I researched the Motenai lifestyle, which translates into what a waste. Next. Drawing from the Kamikatsu town south of Tokyo that has gone zero waste in the past 10 years, Motenai is a way of life that could be enhanced in Tokyo. Next. Our second exercise had to do with looking at unbuilt projects as precedents. Next. 
we began to find forms within these, within these images by creating our own versions of what we could not see. Next, 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 next. These sections were used to create a catalog for our urban structures. Next. Combining these two exercises, I developed my what if then statement. Next. What if we were to consider Ueno train station in Tokyo, not as purely as a transit center, but as a new urban typology specifically designed to house and maintain a bustling Motenai community focused on zero waste living and working. Next. Then a megastructure could begin to fulfill the needs of residents, businesses, and waste collection workers in order to create a harmonious Motenai lifestyle. Next. By building above the existing train station in a neighborhood with an existing high density, this project would activate unused space with minimal intrusion. This model could plug into the existing Ame Yokocho Shotengai below the Ueno train station and rehabilitate vacant storefronts that struggle to compete with dominating department stores. Next. Next. I then began researching different scales of repurposed architecture and waste, such as landscape. Next. Building. Next. Furniture and spaces. Next. And materials. Next. Next. Additionally, some of the interesting combinations seen in uh, Atelier Bauwau's Made in Tokyo's book um, started to play an influence on my project as well, such as uh, the combination highway department store. Next. 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 And the bridge home. Next. I began to create my own library of primitives for both commercial next, and residential spaces, building off of existing Tokyo storefronts and facades. Next, next. While the structure sits over the train tracks, it links both sides of the city and begins to reach out into the urban fabric with multiple connection points to the street and to the ground level of Ueno Park. The structure becomes a catalyst for the city to take part in the Motenai lifestyle supported by this structure. Next. So here are a few views that show this hill town created by a combination of residential, commercial, and waste reduction infrastructure. Next. Next. By studying existing Tokyo facades, I started thinking about how building materials could be reused to build up this urban structure incrementally over time. Next. Next. The structure attempts to create both compact and efficient spaces while also allowing for large open plazas and public space. Next. Uh, so these next few slides, you can just flip through. Um, the next steps will create, we'll go into creating a larger oblique drawing um, that lays out multiple section cuts showing the inner workings of the urban structure and how the different relationships of primitives to plaza to existing site interact as a system. Thank you. Great, thank you. And the final presentation from this set will be a student representing the Mario Gooden studio. Um, hello everyone, my name is Benjamin Gomez. I will be sharing with you the work of the water studio led by Mario Gooden. Uh, I will be going through a brief presentation of each student's work. Uh, the Space of Water Studio investigates the cultural topographies of water informed by the line from colonialism to climate change in consideration of forced migration, resources extraction, environmental degradation, and water scarcity. Next. Uh, in that sense, students propose a series of projects that relate to those issues using water as a common factor that relates socially, historically, and environmental, environmentally with the context of Cape Town in South Africa, a city that has been known for its uh, relationship with water and the access to it as a main character in the development of the city. Next. 
for the first project um, through the analysis of the Tuhaku earthquake uh, focuses on the physical variables of ocean water to interrogate the feasibility of being an aquaterrestrial organism. Next. Jolene's project found that the lack of water in Cape Town Peninsula in South Africa causes dried out soil and fires that encompass uh, and displace indigenous species. Next. Uh, this project seeks to visualize interspecies migration movements due to destructive fires, creating architecture that can set on fire to regrow the local mm -hmm. fine bush species environments. Next. Uh, Sultan's project is focused on studying the wind and the wave direction mm -hmm. to predict fish and bird migration at the time of a man-made disaster. Next. He researched about the wide ocean section showing the different species that live in the deep ocean and oil spill near Louisiana that affected migrant birds and the species that live under the Gulf floor. Next. Brandon's project found that as climate change causes drastic shifts in pre-existing movement of wildlife, it is important to follow the human response from northward fishing migration in Iceland causing international conflict, next, to understanding the efforts of traditional fisher people in Cape Town, next. Uh, the project looks to provide a place of learning and growth for scientists, artists, traditional fisher people, and the fish themselves to sustain both environmental environment and their own cultural practices. Next. Uh, in this project, Hajir research on forced migratory patterns in the wake of natural disasters that led to an investigation into the relationship between collective memory, water, landscape, and forced migration in pre-colonial, post-colonial apartheid era in future Cape Town. Next. The project explores how a divided neighborhood's relationship to water might be rescripted through the repurposing of colonial infrastructure previously used to systematically govern the distribution of water. Next. Ugur's project aims to remediate the, Kuil, the Kuyos River first and connect the part of Kayalitsa Township that have been segregated due to apartheid era policies and urban development. Next. Uh, to this end, the project uh, is laid out as a green belt, blue belt, a connected series of waterways constructed wetlands and bioswales that connect the existing but neglected parks, urban farms, and um, community gardens within the township, relying on a pin type stilts as foundation, which uh, bolsters the existing cultural fabric of the township and improves the condition of its water without much intervention. Next. And uh, finally, uh, my project consists on a two kilometer long pier that creates a connection between the community of Kayalitsa and the sea. Next. It's intended to be placed 50% on water and 50% over the ground, giving the community a connection to the sea. A connection that has been historically denied by previous apartheid policies and current unequal environments. Next. Uh, the pier is a public promenade that intends to give access and restore the right of recreation, education, and energy that the, the sea has to offer to the community. It hosts uh, spaces for recreation, next, as well as spaces for research and creativity for local um, foreigner scientists and artists. Next. It is it is meant to create a strong special gesture in the landscape of the zone and proposes a radical and strictly public program that connects both land and the sea with an inflection in the middle at the beach. Next. Consisting of a desalination plant that is connected to a public park, an Olympic pool complex and the surrounding set for the surrounding settlements. Next. Uh, recreation ocean saline pools, a surfing school, and um, fishing decks. Next. And um, temporary residences for scientists and artists along uh, with labs uh, with a salinity center and a sea and an eolic park. All of these uses intend to provide a benefit for the community on land and for the context around it. 
and finally next. And in conclusion, the project intends to make the sea the ultimate public space as well as source of recreational knowledge and energy. Thank you. Great, thank you. And now we'll um, go into discussion mode. Um, and at this point, um, I think we may also broaden the discussion and invite in any comments from other advanced uh, Studio 6 faculty, but I think we can start off with the, with the discussion with our invited guests. Oh, Stephanie, I Sorry. think you're on mute. Yeah. yeah, there you go. <laughs> Sorry about Thanks. that. I say I can jump in first just to offer, you know, a, a very um, simple comment, but I thought one element that was really interesting that bridged a few of these projects um, in a, a really lovely way that I think responded to some of the earlier questioning was, um, and particularly I'm thinking of the Tokyo project, the Lima project, and the one in the Amazon. Um, where, you know, each of these projects were really trying to make this bridge between uh, personal behavior, uh, elements of, um, that are happening in, typically in the household, and then really making a bridge out towards uh, social infrastructure and public space. And I think those connections, whether they're dealing with uh, waste, in the Tokyo example, uh, domestic labor in the Lima example, which is literally seen as being um, within the household and hidden from view, um, or uh, local languages and local language preservation, which one would tend to think of as the work of families, the work of communities. Um, I think it was quite beautiful how each of the projects were trying to figure out what it means to create um, a space and, and how to best support those different issues and taking some of the burden, uh, not taking on all of the burden of larger systemic issues, um, not completely rethinking waste systems, not completely rethinking the economics of labor in Lima, but saying, is there a way to intervene and create some social infrastructure that can actually uh, address or start to make visible those issues? Um, and I thought each of those projects did that in a very, a very interesting way. Um, for me, and maybe this is just because of my orientation as a historian, um, one of the threads that I um, found very prominent across a number of the projects is that um, uh, I was impressed by the ways that um, several projects started with a, a kind of rich historical analysis or analysis of a historical condition. And then several of them had a kind of um, were oriented around an attempt to redress history somehow. Um, and, and, but in very di di divergent ways. So, you know, um, in the case of the um, Commodores, um, the idea that you would monumentalize, um, you know, a, a kind of activity that has been um, undervalued or made modest and that you would also insist on, you know, both boys and girls undergoing domestic uh, training or training in domestic work, you know, that's a form of kind of redress um, or, uh, um, and I think, you know, you could sort of trace this idea of sort of um, uh, analyzing historical wrong or condition and somehow trying to um, respond to it. In the studio from Mark Wasuda, the militarization of memory, I mean, um, in that case, it's sort of like taking this, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of problematic um, practice of memorialization and, and you know, state-sponsored veneration, I think is the phrase that you used, and pushing it to its extreme, like the, the response then of the architectural project is to kind of point out the absurdity or the kind of farcical quality of it by sort of exacerbating it. Um, and I think that, that comes up again and again in, in several of the projects. So it, it was very, um, it made me think a lot about how, how does architecture sort of address um, his history. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to tag on to that in a way because I, I found it really interesting to see how architecture in all these projects was leveraged to deal with equity and representation. And to come back to David's earlier question at the end of the previous session, whether we should always be looking at just the building or maybe in a more systemical 
way of like how do we address big challenges um, in the built environment like climate change, like equity and representation and COVID? And do we do that just through a building or through looking at the bigger picture? And I really felt that in all of these studios, because there was such a um, broad focus on, um, I would say, um, what lay behind these projects, like the backgrounds, the, um, the cultural context and so on, really understanding that, understanding those problems and then really clarifying those. Um, it really makes how necessary is actually that proposal for the building. And I think it does add definitely an, an extra layer, but I'm, I'm curious, Stephanie and Irene, what do you think if, if that is something that's really needed here or if we could keep it sometimes on a more abstract level and deal with, with just the challenges of climate change, equity and representation or a global pandemic and not go into that, that detail of the building. Mm. I mean, I think what, what is always so, uh, just personally for me has always been uh, quite fraught. And I think you see it in looking across the projects. It's not fraught in any one project, but I think you know, picking up on this question was, is sort of um, how, do we, how do we honor a topic? Right, so if you want to make us, and I think sometimes we, and by honor I mean kind of pausing, pay, paying attention, addressing, we've used lots of different words to talk about how we call attention to or bracket or create spaces for these um, elements or systems. I think as architects, there's a tendency to say that you honor a topic by putting it um, in a beautiful box. Right, and, and sometimes we just can't help ourselves, right? We don't want to just make a school or a factory. We want it to be a beautifully expressive factory. Um, we want it to have an elegant, a unified structural roof. Um, and I think, um, I think it's a big question, you know, of, of what the, whether one is a distraction from the other or not. Right? I think we are interested in interventions and interested in proposals, right? So moving past that space of just calling attention to problematic systems. But I, but I do wonder sometimes whether the emphasis on the, on the image and on the final, um, you know, the, the sort of containers to speak um, can, which also takes a great deal of work to resolve in studios. I think in my mind, if we could work on projects forever, there would be really very little tension. But I wonder how much that exploration um, supports the questioning of underlying systems and contexts and concepts and um, when it supports it. And, and I think that's just, a, that's actually a personal thing that everyone has to work through on their different, uh, in their projects, because I don't think they're inherently in conflict. Um, but it's true sometimes there's moments when there's, I think there feels like there's pressure in studios to put aside the background or the research or the understanding of the system and then make a building, make some renderings, make the, the image of the thing in order to be um, taking, it, taking it seriously. And I think it's an open question. Uh, I mean, my impulse on, on this question of like, do we have to have a building um, do we have to kind of pay attention to architecture or can we, you know, address those sort of broader issues is, is always to kind of want to have both, you mm -hmm. know, and to kind of resist mm -hmm. the either or and to say both and. And of course, within the, you know, practicalities, uh, practical constraints of like 13 weeks in a studio, mm -hmm. it's, it's impossible to do. Mm -hmm. So I think inevitably and hopefully a student over the course of three years, we'll have some, or, you know, a year and a half of advanced studios or whatever it is, um, we'll have some studios that, you know, spend two thirds of the semester on mm -hmm. that kind of macro analysis mm -hmm. of uh, historical and, you know, climactic conditions. And then others where they're also getting to, because they've done that work maybe in another class, um, get to kind of drill down into the sort of resolving the details of a building. And then of course there are those amazing projects and I think we've seen some today that somehow managed to telescope um, at both scales. I mean, I think the one that, one of the ones that stood out for me was um, I think the, the project that Wenya um, presented, the factory um, where it was kind of processing construction waste. And so, you know, you know, doing this kind of analysis of 
construction waste in New York City and the kind of problems generated by that. And then zooming in and showing us the kind of detailed, you know, sort of almost the stations within that recycling um, plant. So, you know, it's amazing. I think that that's remarkable when you can see the world in a detail in a, in a, in a building, a moment in a building. Um, and those are very powerful moments, but, you know, pragmatically, it, it's hard to get to both ends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe that's a good moment to transition a little bit and we can keep that thread going, but also think that, um, I mean, maybe part of this discussion um, of focus and of a range of approaches and of each person kind of taking their own, developing their own take on these, you know, impossible questions and challenges, especially considering 13 weeks. Um, Maybe there's the, the question of like in advanced studios, are these really like thesis projects? I mean, do, it, although each studio has its own system, its own kind of um, issues at stake, its own worldview in a way, um, are, are, is this, a, is this a, a good way to address a, a thesis by within the worldview of the studio kind of carving out your own take on the balance of research and design, the balance of building and systems, um, the types of representation. I mean, in a way though, all of those choices represent a kind of personal direction and voice and authorship that could be similar to what some other schools do as a, as a thesis. So that's always been an open question, for, not an open question, but it, and a question about advanced studios and GSAP and other schools, like what about the thesis? Are these studios a form of a thesis? Um, is the traditional version of thesis, um, you know, one uh, that's valid and offers other, you know, benefits compared to this? Um, so I think, um, again, interesting discussion and let's try to fold some of this into our final set of presentations and then our final discussion. And in that final set, I think I'd, I'd like to, you know, again, start with um, some comments from the invited guests, but open it up then not only to any faculty comments, but if students want to um, jump in and offer their thoughts about seeing all of this work at the end of the studio, about the current moment, about some of the threads that the invited um, critics have, have um, offered today. So everyone can kind of get, collect their thoughts and be ready for, again, what will have to be a rapid fire analysis at the end after this last group of four presentations. So let's switch modes again. And the next presentation um, in this final set is uh, from the Olga Alexakova and Julia Bordova studio. Share screen. Okay, can everybody see this? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so hi everyone, we're Kate and Frank, um, presenting in progress proposals on behalf of the studio conducted by Olga, Julia, and Esteban. At this time, we have studio members in New York, Turkey, Korea, and Russia, and are fortunately all healthy, safe, and adapting to this new mode of crisis production. The studio proposes... Yeah. The studio proposes new resolutions of incomplete post-revolutionary urban plans in Havana by responding to housing, environmental, and infrastructural crises at multiple scales simultaneously. We developed master plans in pairs and then zoomed in to examine a specific aspect of the scheme, either individually or in pairs, uh, framing seven tropical assemblages. The first, uh, and the Antonio Gutierrez suburban housing development is transformed into a forestry production site in which locally planted ipe, palm, and bamboo provide sustainable building materials. Um, uh, Rebecca's project, Entrelos O Arbolis, provides improvements to existing housing, including extra space and external connection points on large housing blocks. Anna's project, using, uses, using the material grown in the introduced forestry programming, Tropical Hybrid strategically intervenes on the existing blocks, adding connections from core to core. Um, adjacent to a major Cuban hospital, the proposal for Alta Havana reorganizes the surrounding community to facilitate and integrate the growing economy of medical tourism 
and rehabilitation while increasing the existing housing stock and cultural activity. Uh, Sojin's project, Culture and Rehabilitation Complex Building, combines culture and rehabilitation programs into one building for patients, medical tourists, and locals. And Chang's uh, project, Healthcare Assemblage, provides a plug-in system of patient housing, collective rehabilitation programs, and uses an elevated pedestrian bridge to connect local doctors with patients. The proposal for Los Pinos reorganizes the site to include expanded programs of Organiponico urban farming and alternative schemes of new housing using tactically recycled materials. Uh, Los Pinos, La Comunidad Extendida aims to critique the ongoing social housing construction process at the end, uh, south end of Los Pinos through the reuse of concrete panels and offers an option for existing families in the neighborhood to expand their dwellings. United Farms of Los Pinos is a collective farming campus maintained by the community. It provides local food, educates farmers, and offers public space for social housing. Um, so now we'll quickly talk through our proposal. Uh, Havana's history could be read through its hotels and their pools as exclusive sites of international leisure, leisure built as enclaves divorced from the rest of the city. While new construction is rare in Cuba, hotel construction persists. Not only does this focus development along a single coastal spine, but it reserves spaces of leisure and access to reliable infrastructure exclusively for tourists. After uh, the successful collaboration between the Veredado Resort and the Spanish-based water infrastructure firm Agbar in 1994, it was formalized into a Cuban-Spanish public-private partnership, Aguas de la Havana, uh, to manage the water infrastructure of Havana. However, the residents of Havana rely on aging roof water cisterns, leaking and broken pipes, and emergency water trucks for intermittent access to potable water. 50% of water distributed is lost due to ruptured and aged pipes in a system largely unmaintained since 1959. Earlier this year, a pipe transporting fuel to the Havana airport ruptured, contaminating the water supply of five districts, one of which is the Nuevo Mercado. A jet fuel leaked into the supply was visible on the surface of water, and residents could not boil water for fear of explosion. The problem is still ongoing. So we propose to turn the hotel inside out and unroll it at the scale of a district, creating a self-sustaining, reliable access to water and a new political organization of management, kind of transforming the need for a new relationship of the water into a desire for something new. After calculating the potential capture of potable water based on the surface area of existing roofs in the site, uh, we found that while most buildings could not gather enough water on their own, they could become self-sufficient when organized collectively. So again, we define water districts through a series of six infrastructural interventions that extend domestic, public, and ecological space using an equitable access to water as a new means of collective and political organization. Um, the roof is a lightweight tensile membrane that extends the surface area of the building to collect rainwater with an integrated filter, creating a canopy gathering and maintenance space. The ground floor is reorganized to program visible gray water filtration and collective water use activity, which opens up the floor. Uh, the addition of a water room that accesses a, or that accesses a facade integrated cistern extends the new infrastructure into the unit as the space that creates a new domestic opportunity. Logia supports overflow uh, and gray water distribution above ground that empties water into a centrally located reservoir while creating a sun shading gathering and circulation space. The open air reservoir um, ex expands the surface area of water collection and creates a habitat for various ecosystems that are by consuming bacteria in the water supply, changing its state for human use and consumption. Finally, the swales form a, a, form a resilience and natural distribution network that links districts using the topography of the city, circulating water, propagating ecosystems, and drawing the water towards a large, naturally filtered public swimming pool. Um, the strategy applies to the organization of every district, creating a new infrastructural, political, ecological community that transforms a precarious relationship with water into an equitable, desirable one more to come. Thanks guys. Stay healthy, safe, and sane. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next presentation is from the Michael Bell Studio. Well, can you just make it into one screen? I mean, it's splitting right now. A PDF. Uh, 
is that can you comment l your your mac system right? comment l can you put yeah it should be one screen but it's not now cut off it's showing up as one screen on here um What else is being shown on the screen? Sorry, I don't uh, really understand what you mean by one screen. I mean, in, on my screen, it's split in it. So it's portrait rather than landscape. But when I see the screen, it's only, yeah, it's cut off in half. So it should be like this. And now I'm sharing like only this. Uh, there you go. So like, is that better? Yeah, I think it is. Okay. Hello, my name is Hyogyang Lee from Studio Michael Bell, also teaching assistant Sangwon Lee. So this is about the teacherless micro school, the about the education. Next. So this is a really simple diagram that computer can replace the human occupation. And next. So in terms of thought and education, what's the difference between thinking and education is education is really development of knowledge, which is knowledge is same as the thought. Next. So next question is how can we build the, the form of thinking first when you're a kid, when you're really young. So Noam Chomsky says that when we are learning a language, there's a basic system of the language and it define, defines our basic system of thinking, next. So also recently, the, the Auto Poises of Architecture by Patrick Schumacher handles also this kind of section, the medium as universe of possibilities in architecture. In recent society, there's a lot of softwares and those softwares are actually building our mindset. So it is really an important point, and next. Next, also next. So the exercise about the transcribing those new points of the historical buildings into mine in the next. So I picked the two buildings, the Gary Tobacco Shredder House and the Zaha Hadis Peak. So it's more like drawings rather than buildings. Next, next. So in order to transcribe the Gary Tobacco Shredder House, I have to understand what's the process it make them as it is. So it is very really important how we get rid of the share how it processed the story. Next. So actually the first mass models of the get rid of the shutter house is actually just wood block mass rather than many surfaces in it. Next. So how it became from here, next. From there, next. So, because Gary Tibet Share House used the material as a medium. In the book of, I mentioned previously, it handles that actually Gary Tibet changed its model material from wood to the cardboard itself. Next. So we, what it happens, number one is actually it was the mess and after he changed his material into the cardboard, now it became the Gary Tibet Share House with many surfaces. Next. Yeah, so as it is, next. So is it only about the material or is it about something else as a medium? Yes, there's also another about the medium. Next, in the architecture. So this is George Kipe's one of drawings that represent the idea. Also tools as a medium can change our mindset. For example, the compass actually see ourselves or the world in the circular system. Next. So this is a simple diagram and I'm using softwares recently, of course. So next, what's the recent area, er, era? What's the point of the software and how it can mind us the different system or different perspective toward the world? So the basic difference between softwares of the coordinate system is left-handed and right-handed. So left-handed Cartesian coordinate system is based on the pixelized software such as Photoshop, Houdini, Blender. And right-handed coordinate system is actually many softwares that has been used for architects, 
Rhino, AutoCAD, or SketchUp, it is safe. And next. So why these coordinate systems are important is that depends on the coordinate system you're using, you use the different method to read the coordinate system. So for example, this left coordinate system and right coordinate system reads the coordinate system really reversely. So next. So first version of the transcription, uh, transcribing is really simple. Just bending the Gary Richbert house instead of really simple plan. So how this could be connected to the education and the, as a perception, next. So this is one of the tasks that Georgia Keep is handling why broken perspective is happening. Actually, as a kid, we actually had the broken perspective and multiple perspective in my mind. But after we have been start to be educated, we start to lose it. And I think it is really important to educate or remind them we actually already had the kind of multiple perspective system. Next. About one minute remaining, please. Yes. So how this coordinates different systems started historically rather than softwares. Next. So it starts with the celestial mechanics from 14th century. Next. 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 So coordinate system and coordinate transports are really important because it makes you express the points that cannot express in the other coordinate system. That's why we need to develop the coordinate system different difference and transformation. Next. So next. Next. Uh, next. So with the simple mathematics, the second version of transcribing is Transforming the Gary Tibbert's house into a circular coordinate system with celestial mechanics, next. But the problem is it doesn't have any midpoint because midpoint is really important to transcribe or transform the coordinate system, next. So the point is, where is the midpoint or where is the center, next. Since the Gary Tibbert's house starts from the mass, it actually starts from the, the centroid of the mass should be really the volume center of the mass next. So this is the third version of the described house next. 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 And this is the model of the transcript to describe next. Next. And just next. So how can I put this idea into the space and the education is next. From Peter Eisenman's form to relationship, showing relationship is the basic teacherless education and the basic deep structures are generated by the base system of the rules, next. And what represents the basic rules of the system in a historical building is AEG building. These are short essays why this is really represent the base system of the industrial, next as an industrial building, next. 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 Yeah, so this is AJ Peter Barron's building, next. So as I say, the form and the base system really reminds us the system and the coordinate system that we have lost to due to the education. And I think those, next. Basic geometries and basic a coordinate system could remind us the lowest coordinate system perception. Next. So those are base geometries, the platonic solids. Next. And the divine axis are really important because central is, central is really important. Next. And those different centroids and different midpoints, those geometries gonna generate all those panels and other forms next. And those forms now became becoming a facet and the the architectural furniture of the age building as a micro school pan on itself. Next. Next. Yeah so this is inside. Yeah those are references. Next it's done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next presentations, so we have two more. Um, the next one is from the Adatola and Giuseppe Vignano studio, the low tech studio.
Wait, hold on. I... Well, I can just introduce myself while Skylar, you're doing that. Um, Sounds uh, good. And Skylar, if we need to go directly to a presentation, Anam, would you be able to share from your screen for some reason? Yeah, I, I could try. Yeah, sure. Skylar, what do you what do you prefer? You can tell us. For some reason, the tab that I'd set up went away. Um, I'm just going back to it. Um, okay, we'll wait for you, Skylar, then. Okay. Yeah, the maker graph, right? Yes, yeah. Okay. Anam, you could go ahead and introduce yourself. And this yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Anam. Uh, I'm part of the Maker Graph Studio, which is run by Adatola and Jessica Lingiano. So I'm just going to do a short introduction to the studio and then uh, dive into my project. And uh, yeah, I just have to hit present. Perfect. Uh, next. The MakerGraph Studio operates in two parallels of weekly preoccupations and the processes of making physical objects. It, it hinges on the notions of thinking through making, thinking through bookmaking, and thinking through tangible objects. Next. The first half of the semester was heavily reliant on making objects with material, scalar, and spatial prompts, all the while in parallel with the more personal introspective part of the project. These images show some of the objects made during the semester. Next. Our studio was fortunate to travel to Hawaii during the Kine week. We explored extreme formations that exist in natural conditions, from the lava fields in Kalauea to the black sand formations due to residual lava in Hokena, to volcano craters and the summit in Mauna Kea, all the while discovering, observing, and attempting to understand making as it exists in nature. Next. The second half of the semester called for relaying the making aspect of the studio into a house. The prompt called for two or more objects to work together in terms of material properties and spatial connections. Every week, a part of the project is developed diving deeper into the functional, playful, insightful moments of very carefully designing for precise physical objects. Next. All the work in the studio is documented, formatted, and presented in the form of chapters each week that go on to become part of the final book. The book is the main process of collecting, viewing, and retaining the information in hopes to inspect and detect our most intuitive methodologies of designing. Next. Next. My book is titled Home, Objects, Notions, and Other Things. It asks a pertinent question of what home means to me. Through an examination of my surrounding space and what is now my home in the making, it looks at objects that I've collected over time, their association with me and my space and how they contribute to this idea. It en encompasses simple daily life elements that are oftentimes considered ordinary, but when contextualized become very significant. Next. The first chapter is an introduction and self-reflection about the formulation of home. Through a series of investigations of meanings attached to objects, and notions such as access, safety, and expression based on gender, it transcends the notion that home is a place, rather explores that home is the culmination of something as tangible as objects of affection, to basic human rights, to default identities, and developed notions. Next. These weekly explorations have been in parallel with the intense making processes uh, with material prompts. I approached the objects by using previously owned, found, or collected objects. There was an attempt to push and test the materiality of the objects, and oftentimes were created through a series of repetitive moves. Next. The third chapter is based on a handicraft, the GABA. This is, that is very special to me. That has been in all of my houses from the time I can remember. In exploring it, I cut it open to reveal the back and found the knots and entanglements, the materials used and the trace of the hand and of the work done. It was an emergence of methodology of viewing things, the notion of observing from the front and the back. Next. The wood object follows similar logic of an even flat surface made of 64 found wood pieces uh, and an uneven back that bears resemblance to the strands of the GABA, the idea of understanding through the, through the back and the front. Next. Similarly, another own piece, the shawl, which is a considered staple of Pakistani women, is one that serves many purposes, and something the back of which reveals intricate weaving patterns. That juxtaposed with a metal object, which was made of 112 cans, questions the notion of sides. Designed as a shawl of sorts, the object tries to reconsider these binaries. Next. Next. The second half of the studio brings together these methodologies of, of operating to design the and the physical objects in the making of a house with the processes of collaging and now digitizing those objects to understand and explore spatial possibilities. Next. 
Uh, this is an excerpt of writing from the house of my book, a collection, assortment, juxtaposition, or arrangement, if you will, of courtyards, verandas, vistas, display shelves, gallery walls, storage spaces, workspaces, thought spaces, or cooking spaces. This house is not everything at once. This house is moments, and in those moments, it becomes a home. Next. It is an amalgamation of the hard and the softscapes, the rigid and the flexible. The house is intended to explore new ways of living and domestic cities with the help of pre-existing conditions and using the physicality of the objects to push the design limits. It is a domestic museum of sorts, a series of rooms that act as their own space and expand to redefine those spaces. Next. My book is also called Ghar Asha Khayalat or Kuchizim, which is a title in Urdu. It begins from the other side. Essentially, the book begins from both sides. I'm currently developing my book and the lack of distinction of sides as an operator device to blur the boundary of start and end. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, for our last presentation of the day, a student representing the Juan Herrera Studio. Hello. Hello, everyone. Deploying the archive. Cultural decentralization through archival programs. The history of Spain can be seen as a story of unification and centralization. The story about the construction of a unified identity through symbols and infrastructures. This condition generated a division in which a few large cities are the main beneficiaries and for which the rest of the territory acts. Wait, are you trying to say something? No, we were going to introduce ourselves. Um, oh, sorry. That is, yeah, yeah. We, we are um, uh, Guillermo and Alex from uh, Studio Reros. And uh, well, uh, as you see, we are going to present our project deploying the archive uh, using a video. And um, was the sound working? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sure. I'll press play again. The back of the house, enabling them to function properly. In this framework, we can understand our area of work as a fragment of this back of the house condition. This fragment contains almost abandoned villages around infrastructures, with practically no relationship to them. Infrastructures such as reservoirs, bridges, dams, windmills or dump plants which despite being in use, are not able to mobilize the surrounding population. In this territory we also identify the centralization of memory, where the majority of Spain's cultural institutions are in Madrid. Archiving culture by containing 14 of the 23 museums administered by the state government, including Reina Sofia, El Prado, and Tyson Borne Myth. Culture can be the ideal vehicle to promote decentralization, capable of mobilizing people and funding. In the confluence of decentralization, identity, and memory, architecture emerges as the one kind of historical artifact that could not be archived only in the large cities, where museums, theaters, and libraries may not be present. Castles, monasteries, and churches are plenty. Among all these infrastructures, the bullring stands out as one that represents both tradition and modernity. An icon multiplied throughout the Spanish territory, an architectural typology with unique shape and measures, loaded with historical, political and social values. Utilizing the repetitive and constant configurations and dimensions of the bullring, we propose to build a network of archives through the empty Spain, the Spanish is back of the house to create new opportunities in this territory. From the constellation of villages and bull rings spread along our fragment, we propose to create an initial network of three villages located within 10 kilometer radius to function as a larger entity. In the future, this constellation can expand to other bull rings of this area, and even to the whole of Spain. In these three villages, we propose three monuments to resignify both the archive and the bullring. These structures will change the landscape in the villages in which they are implemented, creating a new relationship between memory and intervention, as a new symbol of the decentralization of culture. The structure in Sassadon will archive artworks from El Prado and Reina Sofia's museums, decentralizing high culture. The structure in Pareja will archive documents and fragments of different infrastructures from the empty Spain, decentralizing history. The structure in Samarancio will archive objects and memorabilia from the local rural communities, decentralizing value and memory. Once the bull rings are resignified there will be new shared spaces between the three villages, a network containing a square, a garden, and a pool, that will create a new relationship between humans and animals. What was once an arena for sacrifices, now is a space for healing. The continuously expanding characteristics of archives become its main visible element, 
Over time the building will expand in unison with its growing collection. Intrinsically tied to the urban fabric of the villages, these monuments open the possibility of new public infrastructures for these small towns. The archive will be understood more than just a storage of memory. A new curator and performer will be the subject in charge of socializing and democratizing the storage content, in a series of intermediate spaces where the archive is being deployed, linking the non-human information with the human audience, while the building and its interior will be designed to allow this performativity. The public role of the archive will be understood as a living entity, not limited only to its continuous growth, but as the way the information is being stored and represented constantly. This brings us back to the social purpose of the cabinets of curiosities, which were collections of extraordinary objects that built a narrative about the pieces they contained, and were the origin of what today we know as museums. The archive will be complemented with public programs related to leisure, health, education or work. The function related to conservation and research will be kept and enhanced with these new complementary programs. The interior of the archive will multiply the spaces to read, research, and interact with and within the performative areas. Instead of understanding the archive as a warehouse, in other words, a repetition of fixed and stable slabs, the space will be altered to allow new spatial arrangements and programmatic configurations, in this case, a series of hanging asymmetric rings. The central area and the spaces in between the rings will allow congregations and movements of people without foregoing security and conservation conditions. The circulation around the information and complementary programs will be the input to link the different levels, allowing a series of non-repetitive movements. A sequence of a bull ring, a hotel, a restaurant, and a pool. Archival areas will be mixed with reading spaces and meeting rooms, as well as with a foyer, an auditorium, and a co-work area. The building will be proposed as a continuous diagonal movement, instead of only a vertical one. The central space will house more public, but related programs that will be linked to the archival rings by a series of exhibition spaces, like the interior of a giant living being. The central spaces are interconnected with several public and performative areas that appear in every level, where the collections will be deployed. Investigation and research will take place while the curator and the visitors act as the principal performers of the space. The project can be understood not only as a stack of different levels of storage, but as a whole single entity that is activated through the movement of people. In this project, the contemporary definition of an archive is defined not by the spaces of the information that it stores, but by the spaces of information that is deployed, and the programs that reinforce its publicness, making the new archive a complex social infrastructure. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, so now uh, we'll go back into presentation mode um, for the last discussion and the kind of wrap up of the session. I'd really um, like to start by, um, yes, go ahead. by just saying that um, I am truly amazed by the amount of work and quality of drawings and quality of visuals that were produced by all the students. And I think especially during this challenging time when everyone had to move during the middle of the semester and like group work and the normal studio environment didn't function um, as it normally would have, I am truly amazed and I want to congratulate everyone on um, their work. Um, and then I really appreciated this last presentation um, and its focus outside of the city. I think that almost all the other projects that we have seen were set in an urban environment, maybe with one or two exceptions. Um, so I, I really like this thinking about um, how do we um, take our focus somewhere else and how do we um, look at indeed those cultural powerhouses and take them away. So I found that very inspiring. Um, I, I, I totally echo um, Tim's uh, remark about the quality of the work. Really impressive across the board. Um, tremendous amount of just um, also amazing research um, and then integrated into projects that are really well resolved, um, considering everything 
um, all the kind of um, adversity that um, all of you have had to um, overcome. Um, it, so since this is the last um, discussion period, if I can kind of free associate for a second, um, the, I was really struck in the last um, presentation that it was the entire presentation was this um, video or film that was narrated by this machinic voice. The machinic voice was very <laughs> strange to me or interesting. I mean, it was intriguing. And it was then, so I then started thinking about sort of, um, you know, going back to our earlier discussion about who's the public or who's the subject. And, you know, in some of the projects today of, you know, incorporated animals, um, materials, kind of broader range of subjects. And I it was just thinking about sort of like um, um, a kind of humanist versus post humanist um, kind of approach to architecture something about that kind of machinic voice and the way that that project was sort of about, uh, you know, uh, uh, almost kind of neutrally decomposing this typology um, of the archive, the bull ring, and then adding other typologies and sort of remixing them. Um, it was almost like a kind of designed by a machine or remixed by a machine. And, and, and oddly enough, even the previous project, the house, even though it started with these very personal reference, um, the kind of end product also because of the way that it sort of deconstructs the house into a series of objects or moments or rooms also strangely is sort of like really getting us away from you know kind of a traditional humanist conception of the house as a kind of you know cozy space or you know adapted to uh, um, particular subjects and of course with the, the teacherless micro school that you know and the opening question of like can um, can machines replace humans, particularly around kind of learning and teaching, which is a, a problem that um, is kind of uh, confronting all of us um, right now. Um, you know, I think there's something interesting about the way that all of these projects um, like sort of make us really rethink these kind of type these, you know, very old typologies. Um, so. Sorry, that was a little incoherent, but you know, as I said, now I'm sort of like reflecting up across the board. At this point, it's it's fascinating to see so many different projects and studios all at once. It's my first time seeing uh, this kind of this format in Supercrit. I'm finding it really, it's actually really wonderful to see these through lines between the different studios, but also sort of take as a a given this like many many different ways of exploring a project right and and finding your way i'm i'm still really thinking um across all these projects to to david's question earlier about modes of research and um i think what that had, had made me think of take it a little bit of a different direction was um how we what are the ways in which we really explore a site and I, I don't mean the literal, you know, territory of this site, but a site, if a, in its most expanded sense, a site which is physical, social, cultural, uh, ecological, and economic, um, all of those different layers. I think um, I would, I, I wish I could talk to all of the students right now and hear from you how, you know, being in a studio, I know my students right now at Penn are really struggling with, um, this question of how to continue to explore site when you can't go there or where some when some of the traditional methods in which we are maybe accustomed to accessing information have been taken away from us. Right. And I, I think it's a an interesting time to really think about those tools because hopefully they won't be taken. We will not be isolated forever. Um, but it really also makes me think of how um, different types of information are always actually um, mediated or uh, have varying accessibility at different times. So it really strikes me that a lot of the projects feel very, very grounded in um, architectural history, in precedent buildings. Um, some are really delving into, as we've talked about already, uh, cultural context or historical events. Um, some are grounded in literature. Um, and I think some other, those are disciplines that maybe are a little closer to us as architects. And I'm also really interested in the projects that are trying to also move into these spaces that might feel a little more distant. Uh, industrial ecology, uh, behavioral ecology, thinking about um, non-human species, thinking about material flows, um, chemistry, racial 
critical theory, social justice. Um, so I, I think it's, it's just kind of an overarching comment. Um, not very many projects have really looked at uh, microclimate or the actual physicality of experience in the site in that way. Um, and I, I don't think all those layers should be present in every project, but I think it's, it's an interesting moment looking across all of those studio, all of these different studios to think about, you know, what techniques we have at our disposals and what sorts of um, information is more or less accessible, whether it's a specific uh, version of history, right, rather than all of the other versions of, of these sites that we could be looking at, um, or other disciplinary lenses. And um, when is there benefit to kind of opening up those different spaces of inquiry? Yeah, I mean, I think this this general um, line of discussion is is really interesting and relevant, um, especially at this moment, because I I think um, as as all the comments have have touched on, the work is like a kind of tour de force in you know, research and design and representation and different levels of taking on, you know, architecture, but more broadly the city and more broadly even the countryside and the world. And as we've talked about at different times, flows of materials, of information, um, layers of culture and history. And, you know, one way of, of, re, of looking back at all of the presentations over the afternoon is to just be kind of in awe of the, not only the diversity of projects, but of the diversity of skills that each single author must have had in order to execute this, you know, really clear and concise presentation, you know, using a, a whole range of, you know, skills and expertise. And, and I think like what, what you're saying, Stephanie, there are some that may have been a little underrepresented today as a whole. There are some probably that each author has that they didn't use in that single project. Um, but as a whole, it's, it's kind of hard not to be impressed by the, the, the range collectively and individually of, of the kind of skills we saw. Um, I know we've gone over time and I feel responsible for that because I was probably not as strict a timekeeper as I intended to be. Um, so I did want to um, give, you know, one quick opportunity if there are other um, professors on the line. I, I know that, you know, everyone can, if they want to see the list of presenters and I, I'm very happy to see that many faculty have joined um, today and, and a lot of students. I know some people had to drop off a little bit early. Um, but, uh, let's see, is there any, is there anyone who wants to make a, a kind of question or a comment before we start to wrap it up? I can say one thing very quickly. Uh, I was pretty impressed that, I mean, with the the quality of the work. I mean, after, I mean, everything that we've go, going through and especially, I mean, the fact that most of the students, they didn't travel and they had to engage with such broad contexts which are entirely alien to their background. I mean, it's pretty impressive how research was well conducted and, and how people were able to really dig into other realities and produce such amount of, uh, such a mountain, such quality of work. That's it. Yeah, I think, I think that's great to hear, Pedro. And it's a great point. I mean, there's, there's a whole like list of things that people have had to go through this semester and still to be at a point where we're having, you know, this level of presentations and this level of discussion is it's really great to see. I'll, I'll just read a note from Galia who I think um, had wanted to join in, but she had to leave for another meeting. And um, she said that this, she found that this year's supercrit was stronger and more cohesive than even in past years. So despite our new format, all the challenges of the semester, you know, the glitches of 
dealing with a webinar for the first time, all the boxes of faces on the screen. You know, I think it's, I think that's a kind of shared sentiment that this was a, a really great moment to see the work together and to, to kind of celebrate the work, even though, you know, it should be noted that it's still two weeks away from most final reviews. So it's, it's only, you know, Irene was saying, yes, 13 weeks is not enough. This is really, in essence, only been 11 weeks. Plus maybe you subtract some of the weeks of lost time of moving and stuff, so. Um, it, it, are there the, any, yeah, The work ahead. looks quite complete to me. I think all the students should just take the next couple weeks off and <laughs> <laughs> rest on their laurels. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a tremendous, uh, trem I mean, when I just look across my notes and think about the range of um, really important and meaty, um, issues that you guys are delving into and with such um, depth and you know sophistication of thought and care I'm, I'm just kind of overwhelmed and, and, and you know very very impressed so congratulations to everyone yeah agreed I just wanted to again also echo that the the work is really really incredible and I you know I hope that for all the things we're all you know missing in terms of being in studio and and being together um, you know, I hope we can find a little bit of um, a few ways in which some of this uh, digital communication actually helps us share our work and feel comfortable in letting things not have to be perfect or totally polished all the time, but really um, peek in on each other's crits, talk about work in process, um, share some of these thornier issues because, you know, uh, a really good project is never built. Right. There's no perfect conclusion to a studio. And I think the, the idea is that's been it's been a real privilege and a pleasure to see all of this work and all this incredible thinking that's going on in your studios. Um, OK, I think that's that's a, a perfect way to end it. Um, I do want to thank, um, uh, you know, all of the all of the students, even the ones who didn't present for kind of producing this, you know, great body of work, for engaging the discussion, for being here on this kind of session, even though it's, you know, late on a Friday, many of you are in different parts of the world. Um, I want to thank everyone for bearing with us during some of our technical difficulties of this new format for the Supercrit. I want to send a big thanks to um, uh, all of the presenters for staying cool, going with this format that we kind of imposed on you of having to say next for most of you and um, submitting your, your file in a way that was a little bit um, thrown upon you. And especially to Irene, Stephanie, and Tim for really engaging with such kind of clarity and insightfulness, these projects and all the uh, uh, kind of diverse Worlds, so it's really a mind bender to kind of jump into all of those different worlds, and and it was great to see the threads of uh, topics that you, that you raised, um, you know, kind of connecting the dots a little bit between the projects, but also giving some very um, specific and relevant um, comments to individual people. So, um, and last but not least, I want to thank very much uh, Lila and Skyler for running this show in you know, a very complicated way, probably, you know, as we were saying, a, a, the first webinar of the school, um, but also probably one of the biggest um, Zoom sessions we've hosted with certainly the most in a row presentations we've probably ever done on Zoom. So thank you all um, to be continued in the final reviews and hope everyone able to find some moment of uh, rest and peace in, over the weekend before getting back to work. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs>